Good evening, everyone. Oops. What's going on there? Just getting carried away with ourselves there, Macca. <laughs> Jeez, a double intro. I don't think it's worth it. <laughs> well, well, I reckon that introduction was about as good as the Crows play. <laughs> yeah, I don't reckon it was worth it at all. God's sake. <laughs> oh, that's Fantastic. funny. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another shit show, otherwise known as the Crowcast Weekend Wrap, otherwise known as the Weekend Therapy Session lately. And uh, look, thanks to everyone who's uh, joined us on this Easter weekend. I'm sure that, uh, you know, there's many people that are away on, on holidays and whatnot, but it's great to see you all in the live studio audience um really appreciate you all turning up there's quite a few maca 22 in the live studio audience and that's right. uh, yeah that's really good for a long weekend so i really appreciate your patronage and support and i dare say mac i dare say that everyone's feeling the same as us pretty bloody ratchet well yeah, I mean, I feel you, you sort of feel cheated as well in the sense that you invested yourself in the club this year, thinking that this is going to be the year where what we did last year will uh, continue and will develop and will grow and we'll yes. have a good season. And what have we got served up? We've had three rounds of shit served up so far. And um, yeah, I mean, just you know, somebody put the words "natural growth" in the chat. Well, that's what natural uh, growth. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what the club did use those words. They did um, organic growth. It was organic growth. Organic, mate. yeah, organic growth. Well, well, we'd be better playing organs because there's no growth. I can tell you that. <laughs> oh, mate! I swear to God, well, well, I just you know, I just don't know excited. really what to do about it. I, I don't it was, know. It was pathetic. We were watching an absolutely dysfunctional uh, team in the sense that there was no connection at all between no. the uh, midfield and the forward line. No. Uh, the, the movement of the forward line defied uh, logic, um, and some players barely touched the ball at all, and I'll do all that later, and I won't be nice about it. Um, Good. Yep. I, I must admit, there are... I thought we had one or two freeloaders in the team, but I reckon there's at least half a dozen freeloaders in the team at the moment that just are not pulling their weight. Well, mate, uh, and it start, the the fish rots from the head as far as I'm concerned. Well, I hadn't got round to that yet. That's going. That's definitely coming. And uh, I did say last week, um, or whenever it was before they signed him, hold the bloody ink until we can actually see what we're going to get. I mean, round 10 was the logical time to do it. If 10, 10 rounds into a season, you know what you've got. Well, unfortunately, we signed a lot earlier than that, and we know what we've got. And I don't like what we've got. It's just bloody shocking. Well, I don't know where what we've got came from, to be honest with you. It's just, it's bizarre. It's bizarre. It's like we've regressed two years. Anyway, look, let's do the formalities, Macca. Uh, thanks to everyone who's joined us on YouTube and Twitter and facebook um and discord obviously if you're in the discord chat of course and you want to have something to say go ahead and stick your hand up and we'll get you on uh we had a few good callers last night uh, last week max so uh hopefully we'll get a couple of people that are feeling uh, a little bit lubricated after a weekend of, of easter celebrations yep. and maybe a little bit loose maybe yep. a little bit loose and um you know you never uh, 700 U uh, subs on YouTube. That must have happened just uh, just tonight. Uh, fantastic. So uh, uh, it's really good, Mac. We've uh, we've grown, uh, I think, 10% in the last two rounds. So uh, really good stuff. So I appreciate everyone who has subscribed on YouTube. If you're watching us and you haven't subscribed yet, please go ahead and do so because it helps us just spread the love, doesn't it, Mac? Just helps us spread the love. Mr. YouTube's algorithm just spreads us out like like little like little bees with pollen, 
and we just we flower everywhere. I don't know, but this little fond, friendly little fella <laughs> you are at the moment like, that doesn't sound doesn't like sound a, like you, mate. Like a bunch of noxious weeds, we just spread. <laughs> <laughs> That's more like it. Now, now we're there talking. we go. There we're at. There we are. <laughs> we're back in Mate, form. We're back. All right. Look, before we get into uh, the devastating result on the weekend, uh, let's give you your fifteen minutes of fame, shall we, Macca? Let's roll. All right. So, um, game one was on. Thursday night, seems a long time ago, and uh, wasn't a bad game. Pies getting up and breaking their drought, and Brisbane uh, in a bit of all sorts at the moment, on field and off field. Uh, the Pies 14 8 92, getting up by 20 points over Brisbane, uh, 10 12 72. Yep, yeah, well, it was a, uh, a clash of the grand finals, and it ended up with the same result with the Pies winning it, um, this time by 20 points. And the interesting yep. thing is that uh, Brisbane were undefeated at this ground last year, but that hoodoo is broken because they've lost twice already this year on their home ground thing, which is not a great start for Brisbane. So no, uh, not start at all, mate. It, yep. No, it would look. It was a good game. Um, it's really where it was level at half time, but the Pies just smashed it open in the third quarter with five goal three to one goal two. And then both sides scored equally in the last quarter, and, and uh, so the Pies went on to win. Uh, the Dacos brothers, they were great. Uh, Edit was good. Frampton, we would have liked him back in our side the way he played. If he played bloody well for Collingwood, I, I, I just don't get it. He's a different player. He he's actually shows some courage, and um, I would, we could really do with him. Do you know what it is, Macca? And I'm going to harp on this all night tonight. Trust? It's trust and confidence giving players confidence by trusting them, yeah. giving them yeah. a job to do, giving them clear instructions and backing them in. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yep, yeah, so that's that game, mate. Yep, okay. So the next game we had was North and Carton. Uh, Carton easily in the end by 56 points, 21-11-137 to North Melbourne, 12 9 81. Yeah, well, the blue is far too good for North Melbourne. It's a school show. Um but I will say this though, uh, you know, firstly, it was, uh, it was they did make a little bit of a bat in the first quarter in North Melbourne, but you know, after that, it was just all, all Carlton, Holland. They got uh, who was a high pick at Gold Coast. They've got him there and out Carlton, and he played well amongst many other mm. players. But they do have those two big guns up full forwards, Mackay and uh, Kernay, five and five goals and four goals respectively. Nine goals, that's more than goals in the week kick, but twice, more than twice the number of goals we kick. Um, so North Melbourne, though, they've got some really good youngsters, and I do like their future because they've got Sheasel, um, Powell, who we didn't want, uh, Curtis, McKercher, and I, and I really think North Melbourne are probably going to get into a grand final before we will. Oh, I reckon they might finish above us this year, mate. <laughs> Uh, all right. Uh, the next game, ignoring our rubbish, uh, entertaining. Uh, Essendon in the end, ten eleven seventy one uh, defeated St Kilda nine thirteen sixty seven by four points. Yep, uh, it was a real nail biter. Uh, it was close all, all the way through. Um, the Saints actually led narrowly uh, right through out until the, the halfway through the last quarter when Essendon uh, just persevered and. Uh, they really did show some uh, courage and uh, high work rate, and and put, you know giving it all when it really mattered. And, and they eventually ran over St Kilda. Uh, Martin Nick Martin, he was absolutely outstanding. Forty four disposals for the game, which is a equal record uh, certainly for Essendon. And uh, yeah, he was a, a, a really had a great game. Merritt and Parrish as well. Um, yeah, but it was a, as I said, it was a great game to watch. It was a lot of spite in the game, and which was physical and it was good. I enjoyed that, um, and uh, well, I didn't really care who won, but it was, but I think Essendon they just showed that they there is something in them, and uh, they've always to me always been a team that falls away, but they didn't this time, and they they were good. A little bit better defensively this year than in the past few years, Macro. I reckon with Essendon. Yep. 
Um, and apologies to those on YouTube. I'm messing around with the camera. So <laughs> if you see the camera just flying around, don't worry about it. It's just me being an idiot. Um, all right. The next game uh, was highly entertaining, and the result was highly entertaining as well. Melbourne in the end, 15-6-96, seven-point winners over Port Adelaide, 13-11-89. Yeah, well, it was another great game to watch, really. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, but really, when you nail it down, Max Gorn and Petrarca were the difference. Um, Gorn in particular. Gorn was outstanding. Oh, Gorn, well, he dominated. He, he's so tall, but he dominated. His inability and, and uh, just the influence on the game was enormous, absolutely enormous. Uh, yep. Razzy and Butters, though, they played well, but they weren't quite up to the standard of Petrarca, who I thought was outstanding. Um and it was interesting that uh, uh, Radagalia gave away that goal by I taking yeah, a chest, Yeah, that was mate? a, a it was absolute possible. brain fade. Decided to take it, a chest mark, really but didn't bizarre. watch where the line was, so he took it behind the goals. It was it's made him look like a, It was bizarre. And it was costly, too, because it just oh, gave yeah, all the momentum. So, but, you know, yeah. I was happy with the result, uh, I think. I mean, I don't... I saw that photo about the Port support. Look, in fairness, I handed up. Port do put up a good show. They don't put up pathetic shows like we do. And uh, so I enjoyed the game. And it wouldn't have worried me if Port had won. Um, and it didn't worry me that Melbourne won. It just was good to watch. All right. Uh, the next one wasn't. Uh, Eagles only marginally worse than us. Uh, three goals, 12-30. Uh, the doggy sixteen ten one oh six by seventy six points. Mac, I didn't watch it and uh, I didn't miss anything by the looks of it. Uh, no, I stopped watching it. Um, uh, there was fairly even first quarter, but the last three quarters, my God, one goal ten for three quarters. That's what West Coast kicked, and uh, I can't remember what Bulldogs kicked. Some massive score in that period. Uh, Fourteen goals odd they kicked uh, the Bulldogs. Mm. So you know it just wasn't worth. Uh, talking about and it's not worth much hit. Well, uh, the Eagles only kicked four points less than us, Mac. Mm, but they, they, I'm sure that they'll get a priority pick this year because that's just going nowhere. I reckon that's what we're shooting for. Um, all right. Uh, and then another entertaining game, the Tigers um, just sneaking around at the moment. 11-16-82 over the Swans 11-11-77. Yeah, uh, the Tigers actually surprised me because they took it right up to uh, Sydney. I, I thought, you know, Sydney was a bit of a flag favourite for me. Um, but I will say this about Sydney. They don't have a great record the MCG thing. They they lose a lot of games. No, and that's think true. They, they will win this. But for some reason, and I think it's because of the shape of the oval, because they play on Sydney, which is a totally different shape to the MCG. Mm. And they get caught up, and they do get caught out. And... Uh, and I've got to pan to the type. I did not think they had the firepower to do it. And I think most tips have got a, a few wrong this week. And that was one I, I think they would have got wrong. Um, but Sydney looked like at half time, like they were going well enough to win the game. But um, no, Richmond had a, a very, very good third quarter and they got a lead. And uh, to Sydney's credit, they fired away, but they it's, an, it's that situation when you're behind and time started to run out. You do dump kicks or you do silly yeah, things. and you start panicking a bit. It's a panic, yeah. And uh, I thought they could have been a little bit smarter with the usage of the ball in that last quarter, but not to be. And the Tigers deserve their win. Yep. All right. So that leaves us with looking at the ladder, Macca, um, yep. for what it's worth. And we have the Giants on top with 12, along with Fremantle and Melbourne and Sydney and... Carlton, of course, Melbourne and Sydney still to have a buy. Um, and then we have the Bulldogs, Port and um, Geelong in the eight on eight points, uh, all on three games played. And then outside the eight on eight points, we have Essen and Gold Coast, uh, St Kilda, Collingwood, Richmond on four points. Uh, two of those um, teams, Collingwood and Richmond, still to have a buy. God, it's annoying and still five teams yet to open their account uh mac last year's grand finalist brisbane last year's up and coming rising stars adelaide last year's <laughs> wooden spooners north 
last year's almost wooden spooners Hawthorne, and last year's other wooden spooners West Coast. <laughs> the rubbish is down the bottom, and that's us. Yeah, well, I mean Brisbane would be peaking at the moment. Um, well, I reckon, I reckon Brisbane are just about done. Well, I reckon I they're. They... Uh, I reckon there's a few holes starting to show. They're relying heavily at the moment on Locking Neil. Um, they're getting nothing out of well. Zorka. I reckon he's cooked. Um, McGluggage is oh. kind of in and out of the game. I reckon they'd be disappointed with Rayner. He's in and out of the game, Mac. Yeah, I thought McGluggage wasn't too bad. No, and uh, the other one you mentioned, uh, when you said he was cooked, he wasn't too bad either. Uh, mm. But you're, but you're right. They, it's not something they can count on every week. And uh, well, and they've got the two big tools up forward who aren't like the two big tools that Carlton have. They, you know, you've got Danaher, Danaher and Hipwood. That you wouldn't put them anywhere near the class of uh, McKay and Kerno. And, I reckon uh, you'll see Hitwood on the trade table this year. Yeah, somebody says in the chat he's hopeless, and I'll tell you what, he did look hopeless in this particular game. He had an absolute shitter. They're, they're two same same, uh, Danaher and uh, Hitwood, as far as I'm concerned. Um, Correct. They they need a, a hit up forward. Uh, they've got a, a good couple of smaller forwards up there, um, and Rayner plays a bit of a cameo as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, I reckon you might find that they shake a few out of there at the end of the season. Now, the other thing that bugged me when you were reading out the ladder with all the various teams in various spots, you know, this opening around bullshit, it is absolute bullshit, Lean. I mean... Uh, oh, yeah. The the table means nothing until about round seven or eight or something like that. And, yep. uh, and I think it's bloody pathetic. It agreed for the dollar uh, with the AFL overcomes logic and that's just logic right out the window i don't think they've, they've gained many more people at all about it and no no and they wouldn't have, so they, and they and they wouldn't have converted one person from rugby to, to afl no i don't think so i think it was a waste of effort waste of time um it's made the the opening season openings part of the season a bit chaotic for for the comp i'm it's not a about fast. it it's a fast all right, Macca, all right, all right. So just before we get on to Misery Guts, uh, don't forget if you're in Discord um, and you want to have something to say, we will be welping, welcoming you with open arms. Um, so get around it. Otherwise, uh, smash it out in... Do you know, Mac, last week we had around about 1,200 messages in chat across the different platforms. That's very good. Well, I think that's a world record. So fantastic um, uh, participation. Oh, just people get around this podcast, mate, and to have that much engagement on all the different platforms. We had people on Twitter. We had people on, on Discord and people on YouTube. Um, fantastic. So uh, much appreciated. All right, mate. Uh, let's go. Well, and and just well, hang on, just just before we do go, I just want to show people. Look at this, the people on YouTube. Look at that, that's amazing. Just slowly adding some graphic goodness to the uh, to the set. Um, took me all afternoon to do that, Mac. I don't, you can't see it, but uh, you will see it. But uh, hopefully next week I'll. Uh, have even more graphics and we'll be able to actually get them off the screens and onto something a little bit nicer but uh, okay. in the meantime in the meantime you know because i've got nothing else to do all right um what's it on all right so uh friday night uh, you know friday night give us a big stage and we just tank just tank uh, Dockers 9 15 69, Adelaide 4 goals 10 34. Two of those goals kicked in the first bloody 10 15 minutes. Yes, and um, then we took a, another two for the whole game, mate. Yep, yep, 35 points in the end. Did not look anywhere near it at any stage, Macca. Uh, played a ridiculously slow brand of football. Uh, we played players that were cooked, players that were injured, players out of position. 
tell me what's going on. Tell me, Macca, what is going on? Well, the first thing is that last year we had Rahili as our forward line coach. And when he went out the door, our forward line, our forward line uh, plan and uh, modus operandi, it went out the window with him because we aren't playing that way at all. We've transferred our defence coach uh, into the forward line, Burns, and if Rahili's a 10, his efforts in the forward line are a minus five. So, yeah, do, you, do, you, do you honestly think, and I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you, I'm just playing devil's advocate on this one, do you really think that the change of a line coach after, a couple of, after two or three years of having Rally in there and embedding in a system, do you think it's... I don't know whether it's Burns that's made any significant changes, to be honest with you. I think, I think the problem is further up the ground. Yeah, but you have a look at the forward line structure. They're not leading to the right spots. They're not making spaces. They're not making the gaps. Um, we're not we're not crisscrossing the ball in there so that you catch people. No, that's uh, further uh, up the ground, though, mate. That's further up the ground. I, I I understand that, but that's because also up forward there isn't much to go to because there's uh, very very static players. I um I would have loved to have put some footage up and I'm still waiting on some answers from AFL whether I can start putting some footage up again. Um, but a lot of pl uh, people on the podcast will recall when I was doing forward 50 entries analysis and um, a lot of our forward 50 entry and, uh, entries were coming backwards of centre, Mac, and they were very, very shallow and they were dropping on people's heads. And yes... Uh, the big Texan was doing his one-handed shuffle and trying to get Pierce under the ball, and he always has trouble with Pierce. He doesn't seem to be able to get in front of him. Um, Fogarty was presenting a little bit, but not that much. Not um, enough. Same, not same enough. with Burgess. But, but the 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 ball movement, the transition from defence to attack, Macca, and the ball movement. It's a, it'd be a nightmare for a forward, absolute nightmare. I, I don't, I don't think, I, I don't think that three matches in, a change in a line coach has that much impact. To be honest with you, I think it's a change in game plan, and the players either unengaging with it or aren't carrying out what he wants it to do, wants them to do, or it's just a stupid game plan. And right now, I'm going with option C. To be honest with you. Yeah, look, I, look, I agree with you. Uh, the overall game plan is no good. Um, but having said that, um, and, you know, there are, I suppose it's a multitude of factors. It's not just one. You know, I mentioned game, that, that, you know, really going out the door. You mentioned um, the players upfield and the game plan itself. There's also the, the effort of the individuals up forward as well. I mean, uh, Peddler, as far as I'm concerned, if they pick Peddler next week, the, the game is a joke. The bloke is giving nothing. He's giving absolutely nothing. And yet he's having a free ride. I mean, the bloke we could have taken, Sarong, uh, he, we held him in the first quarter to almost kickless. So they, what they did, been a good coach, and they put him out on the wing. He started to get in the game. Then he, cut, then he got his game up and running, brought him back in the midfield after half time and dominated the best player on the ground. Um, so we, again, we get out coached, but uh, no, we've got too many players like Peddler that just don't lift. They don't lift. Well, I'm sorry, mate, but I disagree with you. I um, I knew you would. You know, I well, I was very, very pleased with the uh, foresight shown by the club when they dropped Sam Berry, um, because I guess you know he's out of form. Um, but then what they did was made him travelling emergency. So they gave him absolutely no opportunity to regain form in the twos. That's hopeless. That that well, it's the height of stupidity. It's the absolute height of stupidity, Macca. If you're gonna, and this is what I'm talking about when it comes to player development. What is being served by taking Sam Berry as a travelling emergency? We like. I just don't understand. You, if you're gonna drop him on form, you want him to regain form, don't you? Don't you want him to regain form? Yes, and, and there are there are players that are pl playing well in the sample that you could have uh, easily taken along uh, as a travelling emergency. It just defies logic. 
it really does um so you know i, I if i'm coach i'm persevering with peddler i think peddler's being absolutely messed about on a half forward flank um i you know we didn't like pick 11 we didn't pick him as a half forward flanker maca um again we can go through the cba stats um and whilst the cba numbers for crouch and lead were lower that's because the, there weren't as many goals kicked. When you actually looked at the percentage of centre bounce attendances, it was exactly the same. The only thing that changed was they split Barry's CBAs up between Saligo and um, um, Rankin. The other, uh, or is Rankin, uh, one of the two. But Crouch and Dawson and Laird attended exactly the same percentage of centre bounces that they did the previous week. The coaches are stubborn. You know, I think we started the third quarter. I think we started each quarter with Dawson, Crouch and Laird in the middle. We did. Yeah. They are absolutely stubborn. They are, they are um, almost arrogant in the way that they're carrying on at the moment. They're blaming the players. The players aren't executing. And look, let's not mince words. The players aren't playing well. But it's very hard to play well when you're being asked to play a certain style of play and your heart's not in it, in my opinion, or when you're being played out of position. Um, and some of these players are starting to look disinterested already. Look, if we're coming back to Pedler, I think if you do the right thing by Pedler, you would drop him down to the bees. And you play him as a midfielder so he can get a lot of a ball. Just get his confidence back because he, he's definitely losing confidence as well, Fee. And, and um, he's just, you remember, some of those kicks are, were horrific. Uh, uh, in fairness to him, in fairness to him, I mean, he's been ruined by the coaches, I agree with that, uh, by playing him out of position. But I think drop him, let him uh, have a game or two in the bees, get him. Show, just show that he has got the ability that we know he's got and then bring him in when he's in form because at the moment it's just too hard for him well i want you i want you to go through uh, i'll give you a bit of homework Macca. i want you to go through the other sides uh during the yeah. course of the week and i want you to tally up average games played by each of their first string midfielders and I can guarantee you, I can guarantee you that it's probably less than 150 games average. Mm -hmm. right, well, we've got two. We've got two. We've got two players that are over 200 games. <laughs> you know, Laird, Laird is like getting up towards 300 games. Um, we have got no point of difference in that midfield. We get absolutely destroyed trying to clear the ball from congestion with any sort of method at all because we're so slow, we're kicking around corners or we're yeah. handballing to blokes who are flat-footed or in trouble. The amount of times that we sold blokes into trouble and it's because we've got few players who've got that burst speed to clear themselves and that's one of the things that I'll say about Sam Berry. He has got a strong core and he's got a good first five steps and he can actually work his way through congestion. All right? He doesn't always use it the best, but he does work his way through congestion. Matt Crouch goes backwards. Laird kicks it high up into the air. And Dawson at the moment, because he's getting sat on, is kicking the ball around around his body. Yeah, he right? probably we misses out. Got... In fairness to Dawson, he's probably misses out on about 12 frees a game because he's being held all the bloody time. Yeah, but... He's got to overcome that. But the point is that they're, they're sitting on him because they know that they're not going to get hurt from the other two. We had less than 400 metres gained, I think, from Laird to Crouch and Crouch again this week. Yeah, you are right. Yeah. You know, so, so when are the coaches actually going to make a swallow their pride and, and instead of looking for reasons to continue doing what they're doing, which clearly isn't working... When are they actually going to swallow their pride and try to do things that are going to get us back into the swing of things and, and playing competitively? Because at the moment, they're just being arrogant and stubborn. Well, do you really think Nix has got it in him to admit that he's bloody wrong? I mean... Uh, he, well, it's not looking I, that way, is it? I, I still I can't get over 
him coming on to TV and saying, yes, I think the game plan was right, but the players didn't execute it, when he had a shit of a game plan. I mean, he, I mean anybody who's ever watched a football match could see that what he was trying to do was wrong, but not him. And that's what worries me. He is a stubborn character, and at the moment, Fair. I don't think he... I don't think he's, he he may become a good coach, but um, I think he was a reasonably good coach for uh, young players. That, you know, as you as you gradually improving, but I don't think it's in him to take us any further. And to sign him, and when they did, I was just so angry because, as I said, they should have waited till round ten. They would have found out what they were really going to sign. Maka, they didn't want to find out. That I I'm convinced of this. They didn't want to find out. Right, it was convenient. Nix is a good bloke. He's fit into the the culture down there with with all the boys. Um, they didn't want to wait and find out because, <coughs> pardon me, as we spoke about towards the end of last season and during the preseason, and I was very hot on this that we had a difficult run in, and it was going to be a very good test of Matthew Nix to see whether he could make the next step tactically to get this team up and about. And he you has did. failed. He has failed, but the club didn't want to see that because if they wanted to see that, they wouldn't have signed him. So they didn't want to see that. They just wanted to lock him in to, you know, as Tim Silvers says, you know, to stop the noise. Well, who, who, there's bloody noise going on now, isn't there? There's plenty of bloody noise. And there's, there's more coming from me too because, you know, I, I've, I've worked in business and... What, you don't hire somebody on a maybe. You know, if I would, you know, if I'd been managing the Crows at that, that time, if I was the head man of the Crows, there's no way on earth I would take that, if there's a doubt for, about the coach, sign him up like they did. I would want 10 games of him to demonstrate to me that he is worthy of being re, re, uh, re-signed for another two years. You don't, you don't gift things in football because, it, you know, we're not playing... Uh, amateur league or something like that and even amateur league you don't get gifted things but we have gifted him two more years of coaching when he hasn't demonstrated that he's worthy of it so maka it's it's an arab i can see your hand up there we will get you on in a moment um and thanks very much i um i'm starting to really worry because when you when you look at the history of Adelaide of the Adelaide Footy Club, every time there's been uh, an upheaval, okay, um, for for various reasons, and I'll go through a few in a second. Every time there's been an upheaval, it hasn't taken all that long for the club to turn back, return back to this this state of complacent arrogance, right? So you know. We had the situation with Cornsy. He got chucked out and Malcolm comes in. Malcolm sweeps the club out and we win two flags. Okay? Less than yep. six or seven years later, we are so complacent that we're about to put our coach, Neil Craig, on the bloody books as a staff member. Right? That's how complacent we got, having not won anything. And then, you know, carry on a little bit further and, and, and we get feeling because, you know, Neil's gone and, and Sando was no good. We get feeling... And he starts talking about honesty. He starts talking about work ethic. He starts talking about elite standards and all the rest of it. Sadly, Phil passes away. And within two years, three years of that happening, we've tanked a grand final. The club has gone on on this ridiculous camp situation. We've hired jobs for the boys with Burton and all the rest of it. We've gone all the way away. I have not heard the phrase elite standards or man conversations uttered in our club room since, and yet everyone, everyone bought into that mantra when Phil was there. And it, I, I, I find it staggering that they all bought into that club, not only players but administrators as well, they all bought into that mantra. And as, as soon as the dust has settled on what happened with Phil, that's all out the window. And now we're going back to what's comfortable. So anyway, we sack Burton, we sack Pike. You know, we have our football review, which turned into a football department review, not a whole of club review. And here we are again three years later, hiring coach for no reason. We've, we've caved into nine protesters, Macca, 
and oh, lost a th- and lost and lost a third of our freaking training facility over the, over nine protesters, right? Yep. Resign Nick's and we and we're still playing blokes. We're still playing senior players that couldn't get us over the line back the last time we had a shot at it in 2017. Brody Smith, Rory Laird, Matt Crouch, Tex Walker, they're all still there, right? We we have this I, I think there's a problem with the club. I, I really do think there's a cl- problem with the club. Well, I think there is too. In their standards of what's acceptable, and I'm glad you uh, you raised the thing about the club rooms. Uh, you know, really, the club the club just buckled and buckled and buckled. And I know that is difficult, but they should have put the pressure on the government because it's a major development. It's not. It's not just you know a hundred million dollar is is a major development. And the government's just had the right to say, well, just do it. And that's what the government should have done if they weren't bloody uh, uh, Port Adelaide Barra, because I'm sure that that would have been done, because they, they certainly did the same for Port Adelaide. When they when the uh, people down the port, they didn't want the port development to be where it was, the government just waved it aside, made it just, just ignored the protesters and just pushed it through, and away they went, and they just got what they want. And... Yeah, we we should have just been tough and just said, no, that's that's what we want. But the council had approved it. The council had approved it, for God's sake. And yet the government has listened to about nine or ten or whatever. Nobody goes to that bloody place. And it's all about no, nine, no. Bloody, nine bloody nine bloody trees. I drive past there all the time, Macca, and there's bugger all people that ever go there. Is And those people that were protesting, they were just serial protesters out to agitate. They don't live in the area. They don't live in the zone. But even if they did, who cares? Nine people. How many people in the in the West Torrens area? Tons, About 30, right? Now. So it, it was weak as piss. John Olsen has been very good at being a politician, but he has not got one result yet. Not one result. And his board is complicit in prematurely signing Matthew Nix on the back of nothing, and Tim yep. Silvers is in, implicated in this as well as CEO. We've got Adam Bloody, what's his Adam Kelly, football, who we never hear of. Who's what is he? Is is he a lame duck? What's he actually doing? Well, you could say that about all of them, mate. You could say that about all of them because they don't have the profile. They just don't have the profile. And when they do, we just want to be good citizens all the time rather than uh, make our club the best club. You can't always be the best citizen in the world to get what you want. Port Adelaide no. didn't worry about being the best citizen in the world. They wanted what they want and they got it down the port. And what they've got is terrific. And they and that was against what uh, the residents wanted. But they just went ahead and done it anyhow because they and the government helped them do it. We were just so weak. We should have got the government on side and just said, look, you did it for Port Adelaide. Now you, now you do it for us too and put some political pressure on it and do that it's, publicly it's, as well. It is, I, don't, I don't want to dwell on it, but I'm just... We seem to be all the way back where we started and we seem to go through this cycle. And whenever co- someone comes in and shakes it up, the, it's almost like the club holds on for dear life, tolerates it, and then yep. when they're finally gone, everyone breathes a big sigh of relief and they go back to their, their normality, their little comfort zone, their little complacent, happy place, right? There is no... We, we should be a, an absolute powerhouse in this state. Yes. The, but I'm what right. I'm seeing, what I'm seeing, Macca, and I hate to say this, but what I'm seeing, irrespective of the... Like, Port make a fair amount of blues, they've continued with Hinckley when we all know he can't coach and all this sort of stuff. But at least the people that are barracking for Port Adelaide are barracking for a decisive football club. Yep. Right? And I wonder whether we're returning to the norm where, you know, Port Adelaide were dominant in the SANFL and the rest of the eight clubs, the nine clubs, did everything to try and stand their power, but they just went ahead and did stuff anyway and kept winning and all the rest of it. I just wonder whether we're returning to the status quo in South Australian football. Well, not not, not might not be voluntary, but it is happening. Uh, we are. It's a mindset, Mac. Well, 
The other thing too is what I do admire about Port Adelaide. They aren't frightened to get rid of a player to get another player. In other words, no, they, they act like a football club. Amon was basically told all year last year, you are going, you're, we're going to trade you at the end of the year because we need some uh, trade capital because we traded it all last year, so we need new, new trade capital. It wasn't yeah. that all of a sudden Amon said, I want to go to bloody Hawthorne or wherever he went to. Mm. He was told, I know as mm. fact, that he was told during the year that he was going oh, to be yeah. traded. Yeah, yeah, I know. So they make they do make the hard decisions and they actually do them. Whereas we'll keep, we'll you know Sloan. They're going to. I bet you we play Sloan. And I mean the guy, even when Sloan's one hundred and five, we'll play him. <laughs> will we, Mac? I don't know whether I'll be able to tolerate that. Well, I will, we'll wheel him out, put him in position, and say if, if, that's your if, spot. Oh, mate, if we. Um... Yeah, if we wheel him out, I, I I don't know whether I can continue <laughs> because I, I really uh, that's not being hyperbolic. And look, you know, I, there is a danger of throwing the baby out with the bathwater here. We're three and zip. It's early days. We're not. We haven't met expectations. We all had high hopes for this season. There's still twenty odd rounds that we can turn it around and all the rest of it. But there's just so many worrying signs of repeated behaviour. Picking players that aren't fit, picking like why did Brody Smith get gifted a two hundred and fiftieth game? There well, was absolutely he, you talk about Sam Barry being out of touch. Well, I would have played Sam Barry ahead of Brody Smith a thousand times. Well, not the same position, but uh, Brody Smith on form didn't justify his game, and he actually didn't play a horrible game for his two hundred and fiftieth. Um, but his two games prior to that were absolute stinkers, and, and in a normal situation. You could get well get dropped for that. Um, but his first like five said, minutes, his first five minutes, Macker. I think he got one kick smothered, and he handballed to grass another time, and missed a missed a, an easy outlet handball another time. Like, sorry. Yeah, but that's but yeah. that's good by his current standards. Yeah, I know, but it's not good enough. It's not good enough. I'm not letting that one go because he was he was selected before the previous week's game. He was promised yeah. a block of three oh, games because they had everything was. bloody had everything organised, you know, family tickets over in Frio and all the rest of it. That it they was did. all organised two weeks out. Uh, that's true, um, but it's interesting now he's got his two fifty up. Whether they'll make any change, I'm sure they won't. But they really, no, they I mean, because we've lost poor old Wayne Miller now, so we will go the play the experience card. But surely Nan Curvis has got to come in. Well. You'd think, I mean, let's talk briefly about the twos because there were some really good performances in the twos. Uh, Nat Kerber certainly played very well off half-back. Uh, Billy Dowling had an excellent game, including kicking a nice monster 55-metre dob for the sealer. Uh, when in the game, odd, man. 30-odd thir touches. Um, a young Bond, I thought, showed a bit in the middle. I thought that was his best game for the club. He sort of came out of nowhere. So he good to see him good. fit and firing. Um, you know, there was there was a few others. So uh, there's, a, there's a bit to come in and they need to be played. And, um, you know, we've got Miller, obviously, unfortunately, with his ACL, which is uh, terrible for him. And irrespective of what we're talking about, no one wishes any, uh, an injury on anyone. So, um, you know, terrible luck for Wayne and we wish, wish him all the best. But you would think that Nan Curvis has to come in for him, Mac? Yeah, yeah. Um Young Oscar Ryan, he plays halfback, Frank, and the guy that we drafted this year, he, and he played yep. very well as well. But yep. um, I, I would bring Nan Curvis in because he's got a bit of experience. Um, so, and, and I and I'd consider bringing Dowling in as well uh, because if they, you know, if he's not going to reward good form in the twos, uh, then, then when, when 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 are you going to play these guys? Murphy's injured. Well, if you're well. Sam, if you're Sam Barry, you you don't get played at all. You just sit on the pine. <clears throat> Look, I think I, I don't know what they're going to do. Uh, it, they're too hard to predict. I mean, they're not hard to predict because they do the same thing all the time. Um, you would think that uh, they'll just replace the injured players. Um, they'll continue to play Tex, even though he's clearly hampered by a back injury, um, and uh, they'll continue to play. Laird and, and Crouch in tandem through that midfield and uh, we'll continue to lose. It's simple as that. 
that's an exciting future you've just outlined there, Faye. Well, I mean, that, uh, that's what we've got ahead of us. Let's let's bring Arab in, Mac, uh, just for a little bit of change of voice. And Arab's always uh, got something intelligent to say. How are you going, mate? Hello, guys. How are we today? Arab, my Very man. Good. How are you? Uh, so, to be honest with you, I was like a little bit mad watching the game. But then I'm like, I don't think it's just the players. Let me see what's... Let me do a bit of homework, I guess, and see what's going on at the club. And then I go and look at, like, we talked a bit about John Olsen, but he's also, like, had some issues, and some people are saying he's a corrupt politician or whatever. It doesn't matter. Tim Silvers, we brought him in, and I'm like, what's his history? He was usually just a financial executive guy. He wasn't. He doesn't really have much say in, like, leading clubs. He only had one year in that role and wasn't even that much higher up. And then well, I'm I like, think he was CFO right, at like, Hawthorne, wasn't he? Yeah. Chief financial officer the, at Hawthorne, I think. He was, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and then you look at our development coaches, and I'm like, this is, the, I think, the biggest problem. We have Andrew McPherson, who we delisted him, and then literally the same year we're like, oh, hey, come here and become a coach as a development coach when you couldn't even make it as an AFL player. I understand he had um, concussion issues, but still, he was delisted because no, he couldn't make it. Issues to the with AFL McPherson. <clears throat> it yeah. was yeah, uh, soft, soft tissue injuries with Mc, McPherson. It's a but, very good and point then, you make, though, Arab. And then Jack Homsch, which is like still average. And then you look at like Matthew Wright, who is just who literally hasn't had any like real development in other clubs, where he isn't really coached, and he just came from a sample. And then you look at Mark Marco Bello, and we're like. Seven years at Hawthorne, but those seven years, it was when they were getting out of that three P, and he hasn't, he didn't develop any players at that time, and he hasn't done much as well for the Crows. And then you look at, and then I was like, let me look at our coaching structure, and then I see um, Collingwood, and they've got ten coaches there, and we've got like five, six including um, Matthew Nix, and all of them have to take like one or two or three roles, and I'm like. How are we expecting to do all this work and still come up with a decent game plan and get around to all like 40 players at the club and do all these things? Isn't that a bit too much? And it's just, and this club just seems to be, I don't know, just coached in a very weird way. And, and the structure of the whole department just seems off. There is, it seems like from John Olsen all the way to down to like, Matthew Nix, even Matthew Nix, like if you look at his coaching history, he has not come from a successful club at all. He just came from a rebuilding club after rebuilding club after rebuilding club. GWS, um, Port Adelaide, when they were kind of going through that little bit of rebuild, he was there. And then he went to Sydney. When they were going through that little bit of rebuild, he was there. He never really saw that much success as a coach or to see a club actually succeed. And if you look at the past few years of where um, the coaches came from, who won the grand finals, you see that they all had some good years as players where or they came from a successful background. For example, Craig McRae came from Richmond and had that four years playing with a Brisbane Lions. You just there is not enough experience to push these kids, these players, the next level. And it's just that's a I'm done blaming the players because I'm looking at this and I'm like, how can I blame these kids who are not being developed properly, who don't have the right, who does, who doesn't seem to have the right structure for them to develop to be the best version they can be? Like that's just my opinion at the moment. I'm just, I want this to change. Well, if everything you said there is true uh, and, and and exact, what you're really saying is we've got a shit house bunch of coaches, mate. Well, I mean, I mean, let's let's start because I mean it's an excellent point that Arab makes because it you is. don't you don't really look at other clubs and how they're structured up coaching wise and all the rest of it, but Arabs obviously pointed that out and um, it's true. Um, you know, Nathan Van Berlo is the only one who's who was involved in any sort of uh, success at West Coast. Um, but let's be honest, that midfield could have coached itself back then. Um, did, wouldn't have had to have done a lot. Um, 
Scotty Burns has been rejected twice for a head coaching role at our club, as well as others, and yet we we're quite happy to have him as an assistant. Um, you know, and but you're right with the development of young players. We we used to be renowned for developing our players, Mac. We were. Mm, we we were. used to be able to to take rough diamonds and polish them up really well. Um, and since uh, what was his name, Alan? Um, I think his last name he used to. He was involved with Centrals and and was our Alan oh, Stewart. Oh, that's right. Him. Alan yeah. Stewart um, was fantastic yeah. with the young players. Fantastic. Um, but we've got nothing like that now. We've got nothing like that now, and um, we've not invested in any sort of excellence. There's no. There's the. Point me to a person on our on our coaching panel that commands respect. Arab or Macca, yeah. I think that's probably the yeah. big issue, isn't it? Yeah, I'd like, to, I'd like to have a crack at that because, you know, you made the, the point about Burns being rejected by club after club, and that's quite right. And in, we made him uh, a senior coach and an advisor to Nick, to Nick's as well as uh, as a line coach in the back lines. This year, he's in the forward line, and I don't think he's got any experience whatsoever as a forward line coach. Van Burlo in the middle, well... It just speaks for itself. Um, if you watch our mids, there's just no change year after year when you know all the problems that you've outlined before, Fiend, about our midfield, but he's the midfield coach, and that's, that's what we get. And uh, Homps is our uh, backline coach, and I think he came from the Sandfield, I think. So um, we have got, definitely got the lowest, uh, if you'd like to talk about, uh, people with renown, names, reputations, we've got the lowest of the low just about. So I think Arab was spot on. Yeah, and how I do you agree. expect a rebuilding club to improve with this kind of thing, with this kind of development? Like we're a rebuilding club. Our main priority should be investing in development. It shouldn't be investing in players or things like that. And and the thing and there's one more thing that really bothered me was when I would listen to Rory Smith's press conference last week, and I'm like, he's like, oh, yeah. They asked him about Rory Laird maybe going to the back line and helping him out. And he goes, oh, no, you would have to drag, you would have to drag him back there. And I'm like, why does Rory Laird have a say in where he plays? Like, shouldn't he? he's a player. Be Like, you Agree go play that. in the back line or get out the team. I don't get it. Why is there a say in where it seems like there's this hierarchy in the players still? And I, that still hasn't changed. And I know we talked about it, but it's just becoming so obvious at the moment. It's really bubbling over. Yep. Bone Hilda in the chat says, Senior still run the joint, unfortunately. And I think that's 100% correct. Yeah. And I don't think I don't think anything is going to change at our club until every member of that 2012 to 2018 squad is gone. Tex, Sloan, Smith... All of them. They all, all got to go. All got to go. Well, they obviously will in time, but the, you know, there's going to be a lot of dis- distraction in the process before they do. We're going to well, lose a lot of players by the looks of things, and it's really scary, especially with um, Tasmania coming in and stuff like that. It's 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 going to push us very heavy to the back line if things don't change immediately in this year. And they don't seem to be changing this year because everyone seems to be blind and thinks that we're doing all right. And this is just a little uh, stump on the road, I guess what you could say. And we're just going to be fine because we've got the right players. We've got the best midfield. We've got the best back line. That's what they seem to be thinking while everyone else is pointing. But like, yo, this is not working. Can you change it? Oh, yeah, sure. We'll change it. We we'll chuck in Saligo for a couple more minutes into the midfield and that's it. It's it's just ridiculous, and it's really worrying to see what's going to happen to the future of this club. Yeah, well, so the, uh, the future is a worry. There's no doubt about that. But when you actually look at the players that we've got in the side, um, there isn't all that much change from last year when we were going and looked like and were, and should have been in the top eight. We've got Phil Thorpe missing, um, and. We've put Burgess in his place. Uh, now, Burgess is no Thilthorpe, but he hasn't been uh, that bad either. Um, 
So we've got a situation where we've got essentially the same team, um, and but it's playing absolutely shockingly. And it's, it doesn't seem to have the enthusiasm. It doesn't seem to have the skill. It doesn't seem to have the will to win. So, but basically, if you boil it down, it is the same team other than Philfort, and. Something is amiss between uh, players, coaches, uh, game plans. They, you know, it can be fixed, I think, but I don't think it'll be fixed while Nick's is coach. That's the problem. Well, Macca, if you if you see, if you're in your third or fourth season, and you've been biding your time, and you know, playing on a flank or you know, playing in a pocket and getting a little sniff down again, and you know, doing your best and all that sort of stuff, and you get to get to your third or fourth season, you think, right, I'm, I've had three or four pre seasons under my belt. I, I'm the right body weight. I'm fit. I'm firing. I'm ready to go. And then you look at the whiteboard and you see Matt Crouch and Rory Laird uh, hogging the midfield and precious little time, and and you're res- and you're stuck for another season in a dead end spot. Are you going to play with a hundred hundred percent enthusiasm? I would, but uh, no, no, no. Uh, but I think I think you you not would intellectually, but I think it still does take a little bit out. It takes that five percent out of you, right? Well, I'd be it, calling my manager. It'd be like, get me out of here. <laughs> yeah, look, that's what I'd be doing. At that very top level, I suppose it is different because you know you've only got. A certain amount of time to make your money while you're in, uh, playing at that level, and if you're playing in the wrong spot, you're not going to get the same opportunities as you really should deserve, and your career could be a lot less than it should be. So I, I see where you're coming from, Ben, about that, and, and well, it it's is just relevant. general enthusiasm. I mean, it's you're still playing. Yes, you're playing for money and all the rest of it's your career, but these these lads, they they strive to be. AFL players out of a sense of enjoyment. They love the game and they love playing the game. And, you know, I look at a, a lad like Rochelle and, and you talked about Peddler earlier and they just don't look like they're enjoying themselves. Yeah. Well, Peddler's been destroyed over the last two or three weeks. And, and as I say, I, I, I'm myself, I'm quite adamant that, uh, and it's not to be nasty to Peddler or anything like that uh, or to criticise him. It, I think he needs to go back to the twos where he can and play him in the midfield and let him get hold yeah, that, of the ball that's, a lot. That's well, you've you've made that point, but we're not talking about that right now. What we're talking about is the fact that these young lads are just resigned to being bit players all the time, and and it's very interesting, isn't it? Because we will throw a, a, a kid like Max Michael Annie back on uh, from day one. From from his first first season, day one, we chuck him back there. We give him some big jobs. We tolerate a few poor games, all the rest of it. He's still there. We seem quite happy to do it with defenders. Patrick Parnell, um, you know, like there's been a few of them, but we don't seem to want to do it with our attacking players. Well, that's true. And McInerney, to quote your point, is he they did put him back down there, and because they showed the confidence in him. And he knew that they were showing the confidence in him. He performed, and then because he performed, he justified his position. And I thought in our uh, debacle against Frio, he was high up in our best players. He, and he oh, no doubt like, about it. He looked like an AFL player that's in form, uh, as opposed to, uh, well, probably about fifteen or sixteen of his teammates. Yeah, yeah. It's it's very hard. Like I was looking at the all the players we drafted and literally every single midfielder we've ever drafted since this rebuild, let's say since 2018, none of them, we have had the confidence to chuck them in the midfield. Not Chase Jones, who was drafted as a midfielder, not Ned McHenry, who was the one to punch for uh, Sam Walsh in his draft year, did not, didn't have the confidence to put him in the position that he's played his whole life. We haven't done that with Pedler, who was a midfielder. We haven't done that with Saligo. We haven't done that with Schoenberg. We haven't done that with Jackson Haintley when we brought him in, which was, I don't get it. He had the body. He did all right every time playing in the midfield. We just didn't do it. 
and this is just it's I don't get it. It's it's always been back to the midfield and not playing the players that we drafted for the midfield in the midfield. It doesn't make sense to me. It's like so for example, this year West Coast grabbed Harley Reed last year. Yeah, he was a pick one, but he had injuries and he was he had hamstring, he had didn't really have like a full preseason. And yet they still give him midfield minutes and they yet they still trust him in the midfield. For yeah, maybe it's like one or two center bounces. But we don't even do that with Joshua Shelley, who's been on our who's been on our list for three years. Or even Chase Jones, who's been there forever. Like put him in there and let's why not develop him the player in the position that he's been played his whole life. That's that's the biggest thing and then the development that I see is our midfield players are not being played where we draft them are to be played. Hundred percent. I've 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 harped on about that often, that we draft these kids for certain positions, then we play them out in the bloody grandstand, and you're a hundred percent right. And a lot of the players that you reeled off there are victims of the Sloan Crouch led midfield. Mm. Yeah. The only one thing I will say is that uh, they did play Saligo uh, several times through the midfield, and he looked every bit the part and. Um, he look. He, if they showed the faith and played him every week in there and gave him more and more uh, centre bounce attendances, it, he will perform because he has got he has got the guts, he's got the desire, he's got the want, and he's got the ability. And but we've uh, seen that we've seen that for a while from Jake. We've seen it from Joshua Shelley as well. We've seen it from Isaac Rankin. You're asking that you're asking. Nick's and the coaching staff to do something that they've never done before and that is to hand the keys over to the young players and I've got to say I know I know Tex had a standout season last year but we were crying out for for three or four seasons prior to that that they needed to hand over the keys to Darcy Fogarty and I reckon that you know Darcy's got his faults and all the rest of it but I reckon he's another player that has suffered from playing second fiddle during his prime years to to a bloke yeah. who's thirty plus. Yeah, I agree with you there, Pete. And uh, he has he hasn't developed as he should have because he hasn't been uh, it's been seen, he's been seen as a supporting role rather than the main man. And uh, with Tex getting to the age that he is now, and surely I think this is probably will be his last year. Um, Fogarty, he should be. Tech should it be the extra, and Fogarty should be the main man. Yeah, <laughs> the thing agreed. with Fogarty is in 2020, and <clears throat> Fogarty in 2020 when uh, Walker wasn't playing properly, we were trialing him in the midfield, we're trialing him in the back line, we're trialing him on the wing, we trialed him everywhere. Yeah, yeah. except anywhere to, for any, put him anywhere, in and but, play him in the forward <laughs> line. Yeah, anywhere but <laughs> where we actually drafted thing. him for. Mate, you make some I great am. points. Thanks very much, mate. Uh, Thank your you. input is always appreciated and uh, yeah, go well, Giants, eh? Yeah, yeah go Giants. <laughs> well done, Aaron. <laughs> now, uh, we've got uh, young Scoot here. Nice to see yeah. Scoot uh, come in. Hey. How, How you going, mate? How you going? I'm going well. How are you all going? Good, Everyone good. Well? Yeah, this is we, back we... it up again from last week, mate. Yeah, I just thought I'd come in a bit nicer than we did last week. Last week was a bit shocking right at the end, a little bit of a little bit of temper, but we're quite relaxed now. Well, now, Scoot, if I had if I handed you the keys, mate, you, yes, you run mate. you run the club. What would you be doing? Here we go. Look, I'm going to come back to more immediate issues that I think we 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 should harp on. I can understand what Aaron's discussing, going back on many many years and all those drafts and whatnot. My concerns are more about December and January. Every team member and every a coach of any sort that got interviewed were all talking up Gilthorpe, every one of them. And I found that disturbing, even in December, and every person that was pulled out and said, hey, who's, who's, who's pulling up? Who's, who's, who's improved? Who's, who's most outstanding? And everyone was coming to Gilthorpe, and I found that really disturbing. Bang, it gets done. We're down in the dumps. I, I felt very uncomfortable with the way that they actually – almost uh, sort of past that as far as media goes. I found that very uncomfortable. I didn't like that at all. Yeah, it's almost like uh, they they banked the house on him, right? 
absolutely. They, they, they put so much pressure on him. He goes and falls away. We've got this new psych um, helping the club out, which I don't feel is helping anyone out at the moment. Um, uh, unfortunately, looking at game plan, which we're all confused about, I, I think we are all lost. We are lost completely in, in the back end. And uh, they all need some help. Everyone needs some help. We need to reset, get back to basics and uh, start working hard again. I think but when was, the last, when was the last time the club uh, in game? We, I've heard a couple of snippets now of, uh, you know, it's in the head and it's mental and all that. When was the last time that happened? We, we, we had some maniac from Burning Man drop into the club for for 12 months and completely cook it and now he's gone missing I, i'm sure that if he was if he wasn't missing that they'd have him back at the club again this again is the administration and the coaches blaming players and not actually looking at what they're doing it's arrogance That's and it's stubbornness and here we go again scoot as far as i'm concerned we are all for um the, taking that next step or that that sort of uh, decision making and, and, and helping out mentally when we're all for that 97 brisbane were masters at that they they openly said that and i think blight even had um someone on the side they didn't openly sort of promote that but i always thought that we had a psychologist to help um our lads out to, to some extent but brisbane were very open in it in their three p uh in the early 2000s they were really open about this site that did help them out but um um, I'm all for that. I've no problem with it. But they, 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 they're coming out openly and, and really all guns blazing and putting themselves into, you know, attack. They're, we're easy to hit at the moment. We really are. And, you know, with these uh, Friday night games, these, uh, you know, all these games in the spotlight, um, we're putting a lot of pressure on ourselves, even prior to sort of getting out in the field. You know, um, Olsen, you know, beating his chest, as they kept saying, has just, just put so much pressure on our whole club and all these kids. We get the psych in, and look, I think we're easy to topple over mentally. I think that's how it looks. Um, just well, as an aside, Bone Hilda on the chat, is that right that um, Wolfie from Collective Minds has been arrested for for rape and child sexual assault, allegedly? Because, like, is always a bit of a nut job as far as I was concerned, but that's pretty... That's uh, because they, the, him and his wife, bloody hell, because they disappeared, they they went missing. So this, you know, when you talk about the club doing due diligence, and of course you wouldn't predict that necessarily, but you only had to look at his background, and I won't harp on about it. You want you only had to look at his background to know, to know that he was an absolute fraud. Um, and a lot of the people, I know we got rid of Pike and Burton, but a lot of the people that were that were backing him are still at the club. Still at the club, and the main person that's still at the club, Maca, is Mark Rashido. Yeah, yeah. I, I think Rashido yeah. is part of the problem. Um, Rashido's mates, they get to get a great run, and they get to play where they want to, or where Rue wants them to play. It just seems to me. Yeah, I may be wrong, but that's just how it looked from the outside. Yeah, and the, the problem, Scoot, What do you reckon? Sorry, Scoot, contract. Go on. Goodwin's contract finishes in two years. Rue's there. He wants him in that club. They can hold on to Nick's bottom out. I'm not sure. They want they want Goodwin. They really do. Rue wants him. Yeah. Well, I'd rather Buckley and Buckley's kids leave school in uh, two years. That's if Nick Nick's has the balls and actually walks this year. If he does does not develop these lads in the next many weeks or you know in a couple of months he has to walk then you go for Buckley absolutely but he won't walk he won't walk let, to get rid of him we'll have to turf him I mean he's got he's got a two year contract if, he, if we turf him we got to pay him if he walks we don't uh, but the new payout is only for six months is that correct I think they only pay him out for six months not the full term. Oh, actually, that's that is it's true. That is the new rule. I thought, yeah, I thought that was only for pl uh, for clubs that had received AFL assistance. Oh, definitely. I don't. I don't know. I, I think it's only for for clubs um, that that received AFL assistance, and we made a big point of not receiving AFL assistance and self funding. So I don't think that 
six month clause actually counts for us. I could be wrong. Out in sure. the chat, well, they say out in the chat that it's uh, that it is for everybody, but it's twelve months they've got to pay now. Is it? Yeah. Uh, the the club that we have the financial uh, backing, oh. the income we receive. Why are we not this powerhouse, as you were saying earlier? Why aren't we this this very productive powerhouse club that we should be using using sadly the income it's about members and our support and our backing we should use that to our advantage and bring that on the field start there i believe um yeah but I, I'm, I'm just shocked that we're, we're too socialist almost we're too helping everyone everyone tick we're ticking too many boxes i think we need to be a bit more ruthless be very strong with our money use it diligently and, and improve the club well, I'd like to know what we're actually spending our money on because there's not a lot of programs that the Crows are involved with outside of the club anymore. Um, mm. Crows in Schools uh, program seems to have fallen by the wayside a little bit as far as I can mm. tell. Um, mm. You know, uh, I know that we took on a lot of funding um, uh, to avoid having to go to the AFL with a handout, which is quite ironic considering that we're actually AFL-owned. Um why wouldn't the AFL want it? Why, why would the AFL... I, here's what I think about that. I think the AFL knew that we were in a position where we could get funding and therefore urged us to go and get funding to lighten the load on the AFL in terms of having to fund clubs. I think they actually used their leverage at, at, on our board to force us to go and get funding yeah, I don't think it was a choice that we made. I think it was a choice that was forced on us by the AFL because the AFL has control or has a say on our board. And as a consequence, we had to take out $600 million or whatever it was in debt. Uh, not not 600 B. And about those keys, Mac, It was I'm a fair bit, was you, it? Mate. It's a $100 million project. No, I'm talking about the funding over COVID. We we self funded six hundred thousand six hundred million dollars. I wasn't aware of that. I oh, know six hundred thousand dollars. Sorry, yeah, six hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah, that's all right. We did six hundred thousand mm. dollars over COVID, and I'm sure that we did that not because we wanted to, but because we had to. No, sorry, it wasn't six hundred million. It was six hundred thousand. Mm. So and and here we are. I look. We're not spending enough money on, on, on our football department. I, I don't know what we're spending our money on. Um, we've, we've, we've done weird things with contracts, throwing long contracts at people that don't really deserve it. We're extending contracts that, for people that don't deserve it. I don't know when Jason Dunstorm and Matthew Pavlich left the club after their review, I'm not sure what sort of KPIs they would have left in terms of how to measure the club, uh, in terms of how it was tracking uh, with regards to the changes that were made, but never to be heard of again. Never to be heard of again. Yeah. Yeah. Macca, I'm giving the keys back to you, mate. Are you up? I'm giving you the keys back, mate. I don't want them. You asked me earlier if I had the keys to the club, what would I do? Oh, okay. I'll give them to you. <laughs> okay, mate. Well, they're, they're all yours, guys. Well, uh, thanks, boys. I would do a lot of things, mate. but yeah, see you, Scoot. Thanks, mate. Uh, no, I do a lot of things, but I know the club way. Um, we'll just uh, uh, just box along and just slowly say that you know uh, we're working hard to get our of game plan going, we're working hard to get our systems right, blah, 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 and we'll just keep on losing. Um, because really, it's the people that are managing it uh, aren't good enough. You, know, you, you, don't, you don't give a, a five-year-old kid a Ferrari, and that's basically uh, what we've done with the uh, type of coaches we've got. I, I think it is, it's got to be the worst coaching lineup in in the AFL. Yeah, it is. All right. Um... <laughs> So, you know, we've kind of veered off and gone on a bit of a rant and all the rest of it, which is understandable understandable under the circumstances. Um, I think to round it off, 
and I'll let you round your bit off too, Mac. But from my from my point of view, I, I'm I'm starting to see this history repeat itself once again, Macca. And I don't feel like this. I, I don't feel like the club has positioned itself well enough to rebuild um, and to return to being a club that uh, is always around the mark, like a Sydney which we should be, Macca. I don't think the the infrastructure's in place. I don't think the personnel's in place. I don't think the drafting and recruiting, despite Rankin and Dawson, has been good enough. Um, And our player development certainly hasn't been good enough. And I, I hope that I'm wrong. I really do hope that I'm wrong. But the signs are that this, we may have to turn over our list again. I don't think it's that desperate, um, but, but it's a, a matter of just treating what we've got correctly and using what we've got correctly. Um, now, for example, there's a suggestion in the chat, which uh, I was going to raise. They have beaten me to it, but uh, I've had plenty of opportunity to, so I can't complain. Um, you, you will, when you mentioned before, <laughs> Well, uh, you mentioned about the lead crouch dawson uh, ratio. Um what about you continue with the lead crouch as extractors, but you've got to must put somebody quick in there and move Dawson back into defence for a while? No, they can't be in the same rotation. No, same not way. no. Dawson not in on the ball. Dawson back in no, defence. No, Matt Crouch and Rory Laird. I know. Look, I know you're a Matt Crouch fan, and I know that Matt Crouch has been racking up the stats and playing the way we know Matt Crouch can play. But answer me this. Answer me this, Mac. How many other top-line midfielders have got a dedicated one, dedicated extractor? Uh, Usually every club has usually got one. No, 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 no. Don't give me generalities. So who at Melbourne is who at Melbourne is a dedicated extractor? Well, unfortunately... Uh uh, what's his name? Um, the ex player son. Uh, God. I mean, total blackout. Viney. Not Oliver. Viney. Viney. Yeah. Viney, Viney's a man that gets a hard ball. Yep. And he also gets work around the ground. Who, but he uh, does work. Who, who yeah, at Sydney? Uh, oh, Sydney. Uh, he's injured at the moment. Um, Oh, uh, he's he's about thirty odd years of age. Funny name. Who at Port? Parker. Luke Parker. Parker. Parker's been playing forward this year. Hasn't been playing midfield. Uh, but it, no, he has been their extractor over the years. Um, for Port, that's easy. That's Drew. And uh, who else is up the top? All, all wines. All wines. Drew all wines. Yeah, one of the two. Who who else is up? Up the top. What I'm, I guess, my point is that no other club, is, car- no other club carries two. No, they, and that's a hundred percent correct. And I do we agree persist. With that. We persist with playing two, and then the third bloke that's in there, Jordan Dawson, he's uh, strong and he's got a great kick and he's got lots of good attributes, but he's not a fast midfielder. He's a he's a he's a loping strong running midfielder right so we are never we are never going to move forward with Laird and Crouch in the same midfield Macca and I think as well as Matt Crouch has played to Matt Crouch's standards okay because he has played well but what's what was to be gained from keeping Matt Crouch on the list? What was to be gained? Well, um, at least he can play over Woody. I mean, uh, I mean, he's probably going but to be we're better. we're in a development than... cycle. We're in a development cycle. But, see, if our selections at the draft had been a lot better, uh, he wouldn't be playing. 
but they I mean, weren't. We've had, the, we, we've had this opportunity to have sarong. We've had the opportunity to have butters. We, I mean, the, it should, shouldn't be, it shouldn't be the situation that it is. We've, but yeah. then we took Jones and McHenry, who McHenry, my God, um, I mean, fancy thinking that's going to be your, your, your midfielder. But, it's, but but irrespective, irrespective, we we have enough midfield players that we didn't have to reintroduce Crouch. Okay, tell me your midfield then, Fane. With without Matt Crouch, your midfield. Well, it would if if we didn't have Crouch, it would be Laird, Dawson, and a rotation of the young lads and Rankin. Okay. Well, I'm not, well, I'm not totally against that. But that's what I'm. But this is what I'm talking about. That that that's that's a midfield that you can work towards. I mean, we, Harry's obviously got a long term injury, but he suffered last year from Matt Crouch coming in. Um, Matt Crouch coming back in probably cost Jack Hately his career. Not that he was putting every making every post a winner, but again, Jack Hately played a string of really good games in the midfield, really solid games as an inside midfielder, and then Matt Crouch comes in and they play him on a wing. And ruined him. I 100% agree. No, no argument no, here. Now, I'm not bagging Matt Crouch individually because I think Matt Crouch is playing at the top of Matt Crouch's game. What I'm saying is that at this point of our development, with the type of player that Matt Crouch is, and given that we had a Rory Laird in there already, you either bring Matt Crouch back in and trade Rory Laird or redeploy him, or you don't re-sign Matt Crouch. I do not understand. Don't let's not forget that we we had Matt Crouch on a one-year contract yep. la, last year, and then we signed him. We didn't extend him for one year. We signed him up for another two. Well, that was based on the fact that uh, when he came in back in to, uh, to the midfield again last year, and that was a lead Crouch Dawson midfield, and we were winning games. Uh have a look at the back end of our season, Macca, and we weren't winning as many games as we were winning in the front half. And if you recall, a lot of the times it was when they chucked the young lads in that we were actually getting results out of the midfield. And let's not forget that our game plan was very much slingshot off halfback last year. Well, it was. That's true. All right. So let's 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 not let's not change history. It was the it was the front half of the season that set us up. The back end of the season, we lost winnable games, right? And and eventually, we threw away a very good opportunity, irrespective of the Sydney debacle. We threw away a very good opportunity to play finals last year. Yeah, although when you say we lost games, some of the games we lost were against uh, A grade sides, we lost by a kick and. So, so what? You got to not... beat them to play. You got to beat the best to be the best, Mac. You, we had well, opportunities to win those games. Yeah, but that was uh, that form was about a hundred times better than what our current form is. I don't understand what your point. I'm, I don't want to argue with you, but I guess what I'm saying is that I think you can't draw a correlation between Matt Crouch coming into the side and our form improving because it actually didn't. The results will tell you that it didn't. And the results this year certainly tell you that Crouch and Laird in the same midfield, and it's not just me saying it, half half the bloody footy population is saying it. Yeah, but if you go back to last year, Fee, and towards the end of the year, you'll find that you said that you had to take it back about Crouch because we'd gone much better with him in the side. No, I said that he was playing well. I didn't say no. that we were going better. I said he was playing well. Anyhow, I, I don't want to turn it into a Matt Crouch episode because that's not just the only thing wrong with the side. I mean, there's a lot wrong with the side. Well, I think that's one of the major things that is wrong with our side, Macca. I, yeah, I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to just brush it off because this. But is, I've already. Got... I've already agreed that we could only afford to have one of Crouch to let in there. So. What was the point then of re-signing Matt Crouch? Well, you could have put Led. Led was a top halfback, thank you. You could have put Led back to the into into defence. But that was obviously not the intention. Otherwise, they would have done it. Well, then don't criticise me. Criticise the people. I'm not. Them. I'm not criticising you, Macca. Don't get defensive. 
Don't get defensive, mate. I'm not. I'm not criticising you. I'm trying to work through what the club was thinking to sign to re-sign Matt Crouch on a two-year deal. Well, the way I saw the, the you know, if you go this, uh, you know, miserable performances so far this year, Crouch is when he's got the ball in the middle of, uh, he's actually fired a handball out, or he's done something useful with the ball from the midfield. Led. He earns some very hard balls and just does a blind punt forward. Now, that, that is true. That's one difference between the two. Yes, um, that's true. So, you know, but I, but I would I, also say that Matt Crouch does not hurt any team. I've never seen a team put a tag on Matt Crouch. Not once. Because he so doesn't hurt you, that. right? He doesn't hurt you. He's coalface and he doesn't get involved in transition. I you agree. don't seem... And the only time you see him get involved in transition is on is is halfway through a switch or a little chip kick here and there. He doesn't like if you have a look at where he gets his stats. There's not a lot of open field stats, Macker. It's all in tight and all the rest of it. So he's not hurting you like a Petrarca. He's not hurting you like a Warner. He's not hurting oh, you enough. like a like one of those players. Um, and. Other teams don't put any work. Or, or the only thing that another team will do will try to like will try to win the the, the clearance. Like they don't but, have to put any time. They don't have to run with Crouch. They don't have to play close with him. They don't have to. Do, he's not difficult to play against. But if we, uh, I would just wish we had the right type of players that we didn't have to play either Crouch or Lead in the midfield. Because well, what we what we because what we're playing is scrappers at the at the. The uh, whether it be at the center or whether it be you know at uh, throw ins or whatever, uh, they are good for scrapping it hard at the ball, but you don't get that midfield flow like a Petrarca will give you, for example. You don't, or uh, even Oliver will get you, and he's a, a real scrapper, but he also gives you stuff around the ground as well. And we don't get that from either crowd, will we? So the so I guess the outcome of that conversation is you can't answer why we re-signed Matt Crouch. Well, I didn't sign him, so I can't answer. No, I know, but 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 like you you can't give me a reason why we would have, which is exactly where I sit. I can't think of a reason why we did either. Well, you know, uh, I just wish we had better players to replace both of them. Well, we, maybe we do, Macca, but we wouldn't know, would we? And and right. this, I I feel like we're getting back to the conversations of last year because don't forget well, we are, don't forget after the buy, both of us were lamenting the fact that the club had lost sight of player development once they got a sniff of the finals, right? And it was the it was the young lads in that first half a dozen games, six or seven, eight games, that got us in a position where all of a sudden, you know, we were actually going all right. And then what did they do? They took Rankin out of the mix. They took Rochelle out of the mix. They took um, uh, the only bloke that they brought into the mix was Peddler at the back end of the season. And they brought Matt Crouch in after the buy. I mean, and and what we're seeing now is a continuation of that. So really the, the most successful time that the club has had in the last four years in Matthew Nix's whole reign as coach was the first block of games at the beginning of last year when the keys were given to the kids and that's very telling i i'd have to look back at past games to see where we actually were because i, I you know i i can remember that where we finished for the year but i can't tell you whether you were right in the terms of uh that you well you i know that i'm played. right because i've i've done the same amount of research as arab did and are I you remember we, last year. Are you saying we faded towards the end of the year? No, I'm saying that we weren't as successful in the back half of the season. We were in the front half of the season. I, I can't answer you one way or the other because I don't know. We, I remember putting graphs up showing the, the drop-off in centre-bounce attendances for Rochelle, um, Schomburg, uh, Berry, Rankin, uh, Saligo, all th- I, I, you, I can bring them up again if I could find them, like where their whole CBA count just dropped right away after about round seven. Right. Now, actually, they're just putting up there that we won three of our last 11 games. So that's a very good point. You, okay, I concede the point. 
So we're not going forward. As I said, the most successful block of games under Matthew Nix was the first block of games at the beginning of last season, and that was when he was playing. He was giving uh, meaningful midfield minutes to Rochelle, Rankin, Saligo, uh, and and I think Barry wasn't in great touch. He got dropped after about round three, I think. Yeah. Okay, and so we we lo- we lost three. We've won three of our last eleven games, which includes eight games with Matthew Crouch and Rory Laird in the midfield. Okay, I say your point is well made, and I and I, I'm not actually against your point. That's the whole problem. I just don't see what we put there in there in its place. Well, my argument to that is that we won't know until we do put someone in their place. Rochelle, Rankin, Saligo, Pedler, Dowling in the twos. Um, you know, we've got young Edwards coming through. Um, I've just named six players. Well, we go, Schoenberg, we go when ahead. he comes back. We have nothing to lose by trying what you're suggesting, Glenn, because we're going shit out. Um, well, absolutely. But, I mean, but other clubs do this as a matter of course. That's what I'm saying. Other clubs do this as part of their development strategies. They move their senior players to the bit roles, to the half-forward yep. flanks, to the half-back flanks, and they entrust the running roles to their young up-and-coming stars. We do exactly the opposite, and we've done so for years. That is my. That is the point that I'm trying to make, Macca. Well, it's hard to argue against that one because that has been the, our philosophy. Um it is hard for the young blokes to break in and, and uh, show that they're worthy of it if they don't get played there. No, I do agree with that. Um, but, but you're asking for Pedler to be dropped. I do want Pedler to be dropped because he's, he's played three shit-house games in a row, thing. You, look. Um, well, I wouldn't say his first game was shit-house. You, and, the, you, and, and the next game he got put on Tom Frick and Stewart, for God's sakes. I mean, do you want to kill a lad in the first part of the season? I mean... If you're going to give for give uh, peddler for that, we, we've got no hope because uh, that means you're going to have to forgive every other young player uh, if they don't, if they can't get the ball. You know, it it is a competition. It's uh, to be in that side, you should deserve to be in the side. And at the moment, he doesn't deserve to be in the side because his form is not good. You have to, and I'm saying, play him in the twos in the midfield and get him up to scratch. And then you could just bring him in and then throw Crouch out and put him in his place. I would agree with you if we were contending. But we are not contending. We are rebuilding. We are developing. We are trying to get games into our younger players. And I will continue to say that if you're going to if you're going to bin Pedler and Berry and keep Brody Smith, Matty Crouch, Rory Laird and before his unfortunate injury, um, Wayne Miller, the Tex Walker half fit. If you're going to keep those blokes in, but bounce Luke Pedler and Sam Berry in and out of the side, then you are not ever going to develop a team, Macca. Uh, well, you and I disagree about Berry. I've, I've never thought Berry is the art to long term to be in an AFL side because he's just his disposal is poor and. Um, uh, he's just another version, in my opinion, of Crouch and Laird. Have you seen Petrarca and, and Clayton Oliver's disposal efficiency stats? Uh, no, I haven't seen them, but I can tell you now that even if you can roll them out and say they're no good, these good ones are very bloody good. That's right. That's right. And if you actually gave Sam Berry a block of games, you might find the same thing. I don't think he's got that same level of skill, thing. That's just my opinion. Christian I mean, Petrarca hasn't got any skill on the run. His kicking on the run is atrocious. Clayton Oliver just barrels the ball on the run. Like, I'm sorry, but you, you've got to allow players, young players to develop, Macca. There, there's no excuse for keeping senior players in the side who are not going to be part of our next premiership at the expense of developing youngsters. And if you give Sam Berry a block of 10 games and he doesn't cut the mustard. Then you drop him and you draw a line through him and you either delist him or you trade him out. Right? That's the way 
development works. You give them a good block of games in the position that you drafted them for and then they're either there or they're not. And then you've got to make a call. Is it going to be a bit more development or they just don't have it? If they don't have it, then they're out. We don't do that. We let these players bounce in and out of our side for years and years and years and we continue to play our senior players. Look, I don't disagree with you. We're, we're, I, we're on the same page by one thing. You know, uh, I, I agree with you that um, uh, the good sides, they actually move the senior players out to, they're the ones that go to the flanks, etc. I agree with you. And they put the young players in the middle and that's how the young players develop. But having said all that, I don't think Barry is the answer. I just... He's well, that, I, so... that's, that, that's fine. I, I, I don't mind having a difference of opinion there. But what I'm saying is that since his first season when he led the league in tackles and looked like he was going to be our next inside ball, right, he has been bounced in and out of the side. He got three games at the beginning of the last season and then never got a sniff again. And he's had two games at the beginning of this season and he's never got a sniff again. So he's gone from his first season where he was such a good player in tandem with Rory Laird that he that he was the league leader in tackles for the season and got plenty of ball, right? With a, hor- with third- a, hor- yeah, but a horrible kicking efficiency. It wasn't horrible. It wasn't the best, but it wasn't anywhere near like Tim Taranto, right? So he's gone from that to nothing. He's had six games in two seasons after that first season. And half of that well, first season, he was playing at half forward. I, mean, I can go with you on rejigging the midfield. I can't go on you with saying Berry. So who's got the better disposal, do you think? Rory Laird or Sam Berry? Neither. Right. So you want Laird out? Um, if we Well, you tell me who we're going to put in there. Um, Sam well, Berry. I'm happy to... No. I'll tell you why Sam Berry. I'll tell you why Sam Berry, because Sam Berry will get through congestion and give the ball by hand. Rory Laird will run around the back of congestion and kick it thirty-seven miles in the air. But I don't think we're talking about replacing B grade with D grade, and it's really the guys like Dowling, etc., um, young edit that we brought in uh, as a draft They're not inside team. players. They're not inside players. Sam Berry is our ready-made, bona fide inside midfielder for the next 10 years if you actually gave him the role. But we're playing one bloke who's nearly 300 games, one bloke who's had crook hammies for the last five years and then magically gets a two-year contract. If, if neither of those players are playing then Sam Berry gets a run and then you can play him for a season and come to a decent conclusion after a season, not two games, and say, right, Sam Berry's not up to it. Well, I'm sorry, Fiend, but, uh, you know, you have your opinion on Crouch and et cetera and all that, and you're said fast in that. And I have my, and, and I'm, I'm flexible with what you're saying there, but with Berry, I have my opinion on him and I'm said fast on him, but I... I you know, we really just have to get a better midfield that can actually move the ball properly. And well, they're, people, they're, people. They're, they're not those players though, right? So that's where I think you and I are on the same page that we need to get these other players into the mix. Um, we do need we need better players in the midfield who can actually use the ball and, and, and actually move it smoothly and also participate around the ground and move it very smoothly around the ground as well. Yep. So, um, and to that end, we've got we've got players, we've got ready made made players that can do that. Isaac has shown that he's got the the engine to Green. to run that. a game in the midfield, and we, and for whatever reason, Maka, we just don't play him there. Well, I'm um, amazed he doesn't get the opportunity, and Rochelle as well. But and I think but I think rochelle has got to stop looking in the mirror and saying how pretty he is, and, and get a bit more fair dinkum about his footy. That's fine, and I don't disagree with that, um, but. You, but you, you're doing yourself a disservice if you don't play your pick six 
in the role that he's supposed to be playing. And we've got enough players that we could rotate two or three or even four players through that third midfield position, Macca, so that we don't have to worry about their engines. We give them a good taste of it. They they get entrusted with key moments and they we get to see what they're made of. I'm not against it, Ben. I'm no, I know you're not. I know you're not. I, uh, and this is where either Crouch or Laird, I, I would, I would, I wouldn't have either of them in the midfield. But if you're going to have one of them, you're probably going to have Crouch, in my in my opinion. And in my opinion, Laird is a small defender, and if he doesn't like it, he can find another club. In the words well, of our esteemed football director. Well, oh, I totally agree with that. I mean, I'm quite comfortable with that. And that's what we should be doing. And and a a club like Port Adelaide would do exactly that. They would have done it two years ago. Yeah, I must admit, Port Adelaide are, are not frightened to make these moves. We we are. So you know, I mean, we've belaboured that point, and you know, listeners of this podcast know that you and I have these differences, right? Um, but the bottom line is that, to me, that is. 75% of our problem. I think our defence is holding up pretty well. Probably my only concern with regards to defence is our lack of runoff half back. Um, we haven't had um, we haven't had uh, the drive that we had from Miller before his injury. We haven't had any of that this season. We haven't had any drive from Brody Smith. We've got nothing really out of our wings. Lockie Scholl, Chase Jones, they're kind of just link up players we're not as we said last week no one's breaking any lines Macca um, yeah so our defence defensively is good uh, but we're not getting any drive out of defence yeah uh, you know if you look at young Nan Curvis he played uh, probably at the last what five or six games last year I can't remember four or five or uh, six something was it that many I don't I think it was only about three or four um, but they'll know out in the chat uh, three and um, he looked every bit the part. I mean, he looked like he was playing there all the time. I, I, to me, I think that he, he's a part of our future and he should be given an op- opportunity. Um, but uh, unfortunately, they, they made Smith part of the leadership group, whereas I would have him uh, on his last legs and on, on his way out of the club. Yeah, no argument he, there. He's a master of the dump kick. I mean, even in he's going there... And he did get a reasonable amount of possession of the ball, but he still just kept dumping the ball. Yep, no argument with me there. Um, but, you know, again, there's been opportunities to play other players in those roles for the last couple of seasons, and, we, and we've and we chosen not to. So, you know, uh, Nankervis... Uh, look, Nankervis was coming from a fair way back, and credit to the lad that he's made it to the point where he's in serious... Um, you know conversations about playing um, AFL football because he was a bit of a development player but he's in so he's in like, like get him in he's he's clearly the right type of player get him in yep I agree and but, then um... and then we've got this issue up forward Macca and you know I think we can probably agree that some of it is delivery and some of it is 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 uh, running patterns and leading patterns up forward uh, it's probably a bit of both um, you know I don't see Tex and Fogarty working cohesively Burgess kind of just running around taking opportunities and try to putting himself in dangerous spots which is pretty much all he can do um, and I haven't been disappointed with Burgess I think he's given us what we expected to get from him to be honest well, to be, you know, get, you know what we paid for him, and uh, I think, uh, in fairness, and we've been crit- criticising the club very heavily, but I think they got that right because um, we had nothing else there that we could have used if uh, we didn't if we didn't get him. And so they got him for absolutely nothing, and um, he's certainly been by far, oh, he's a long way from being our worst on, uh, on the weekend. Hundred percent, hundred percent. But uh, in are fact, we getting to the end? Of- as a forward, he was better than um, Walker, and he was better than Fogarty. Well, Walker, Texas always had troubles with, that, with Alex Pierce, but the thing that concerned me is that he wasn't leading Alex Pierce to the ball once. He kept trying to, you know, 
get him under the ball and, and get him out over the back. But not only did that not work, but I kept thinking to myself, Tex, even if that ball gets over the back, you're not getting there first because he was running like an old man. Yeah, he was. And I don't see, again, I don't see the sense maker when you've got a, 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 a 34-year-old player who's got some back issues. Why would you stick him on two flights in 48 hours that are three and a half, four hours long? Well, yeah, it made no sense whatsoever, and, and uh, the result was there, wasn't it? I mean, uh, I've had a bad back, and, you know, in if, if I was in an aeroplane, what is it, three to four hours to go across there, um, yeah, it just stiffens everything up, uh, and it, it was probably back to worse, if anything, so... Yeah, yeah, and, and airplanes are notoriously cramped, even if they do get the good seats. And look, I've had a crook back for the last two and a half weeks, and I, if, if I'm sitting down at work for a couple of hours and go to get up, I'm all stiff. So, you know, imagine what after three hours on a plane. Yeah. yeah. So, look, yeah, no, we, we, he, should, he should have missed that. He should have missed that game. We've got Lockie Glenn in the twos. You know, again, another kid we're going to lose because we just don't give him any opportunities. The only time he gets picked, it's a. It's a a stopgap band-aid solution and he's playing for his life, the poor kid, every time. Well, I, I agree with you. I, I don't think Walker should have played and Gallant should have been played. And, I, you know, Gallant, when he does play, um, he he is he plays with desperation because he knows he doesn't get many uh, opportunities. And some of his, uh, I mean, I remember he played, was it, was it a showdown when he played one terrific game? Um, which means he's got the ability uh, Gallant, he just doesn't get the opportunity. No, that's exactly right. I mean, look at Josh Worrell when he first started. The first game or two of Josh Worrell's, we all thought, oh, geez, not sure about this one. But you continue to play him, and all of a sudden he's lo- locking down our defence. You've got, I, again, again, just got to give these people opportunities. And, um, you know, Darcy Fogarty, I think, has just about got to be. On on his last chances, I think we need Dar- Darcy has not has not proven himself to be a consistent forward, and what will save him is if Tex has a rest for a couple of weeks. But I think either Fogarty or Tex needs to give away for Lockie Gallant, and we need to give Lockie Gallant a good run at it because. We're not getting anything out of either Tex or Fog, and we need a point of difference. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah at the moment, I mean, Fogarty, I thought, I thought he was poor on the weekend. Uh, there was only one time there that he really played like he really, really wanted the ball, and he was going to kill anybody that tried to stop him, and that was good, but there wasn't enough of that. Um, and also, yeah, all the leading patterns weren't right, but the way the ball was coming in probably made them very hesitant to do their leads. Uh, um, it was it was just, as we said earlier in the piece, there was no connection between the midfield and the forwards as to where they should be going and what they should be doing. And to me, it just looked like they're not playing the same game, game plans they were playing last year. Um, no. whether, that's, whether that's just a uh, coincidence because they're playing so poorly, uh, but... It, it doesn't. It just doesn't look anything like the the forward line of last year, even without uh, Phil Thorpe there. Because they, we played, there were some games that Phil Thorpe uh, missed last year, but it didn't affect the forward line structure uh, when Gallant came in. So um, we've got some players that aren't in good form, but we've also, I think, we've got some coaches that don't have. Well, I'm going to say they don't know what they're doing, but they really, whatever they've got, what they intend us to do is not right. It's just not working. Let's have a look at a couple of stats from the game, Macca, to uh, see where our deficiencies might have lied. And uh, disposals, we got thumped in disposals by uh, just about 50, and most of it was handballs. They out-handballed us by uh, 53. Uh, which just showed how they were playing against, and it showed, and they were just cutting us up through the corridor, mate. Well, they yes, just kept but it, cutting us up through the corridor. It'd be interesting to see what the disposals were in the last quarter, though, been because in the last quarter we were so poor, and they just killed us in the last quarter. Well, I've got a, at, I've got a stat on that. I've got a stat on that because I agree. 
I don't know about you, Macca, but I was watching the game in that last quarter when the game was still there to be won, and even with, like, five minutes to go, we just weren't playing with any urgency. Exactly. Just chipping the ball around and, like, going side to side, and there was absolutely no impetus to try and run at them. When the game was there to be won with 10 or 5 minutes left to go, it was unbelievable. I've never seen anything like it. Yeah, I 100% agree with that, Pete. It was crazy. Um, so, yeah, uh, let's keep going. Stoppages. Uh, Riley, I thought Riley O'Brien um, had a decent game against Luke Jackson, um, but I would have liked to have seen him clunk a few more marks, Mac. Well, I think with his size advantage, I, I thought that he didn't go as well as I thought he should have. Um, I th- Jackson I, I was, was in great touch. He had a huge game the week before. He did, and he followed it up. I thought he played very well again. Um, O'Brien, look, there's never a criticism of Roddy right O'Brien that he doesn't give a 100% effort. Sometimes the effort's not up to standard, but having said that, you know that he's giving 100%. He's the one player that you can never criticise for not trying. But I thought that uh, the touches that Jackson had were much more damaging than the touches that O'Brien had. Very true. But, I mean, look, they're different players, and I think had had um, had Riley held a few more marks, then he probably would have broken even because he got to enough, uh, but he just couldn't hang on to them. And I think Jackson, therefore, was more effective, like you say. Um, mm. But look, I don't think I don't think Jackson was pivotal pivotal for them. I think he was a very good player, but he wasn't pivotal. Um, so clearances, we lost the clearances despite loading up in, you know, gun senior coalface midfielders, 31 to 28. Um, so, you know, and and look, tellingly, and I've noticed a bit of a trend here, um, we were up a couple in centre, but stoppages, we got slaughtered. Well, you look at the quality of their midfield, though. Uh, they've got Sarong, they've got Brayshaw, and they've also got Young, who was a, a backman, who they've converted into an on-baller, who uh, had a very good day out as well. Uh, so, I mean, and all those three uh, midfielders are very mobile guys that will perform around the field as well. Uh, and that's one of the differences between, uh, and only supports what you were saying before about our midfielders. Um, these guys just cut us up. And uh, even five, you know, who I thought it would they would have had to wheel out in a wheelchair these days, but but even Fife was starting to get some kicks as well. So I thought the we got carved up by the midfield. We certainly did, um, but I don't want to hear the Matthew Nix um, trope of oh you know they're a very good side, very powerful midfield, very good side. Well, every side is a very good side on their day, and it needs to be us being a very good side on on our day. Yep. Um, possessions. So contested possessions, they won by eight. Uncontested possessions, as you would expect with a handball count, they uh, were up by almost fifty. So they got, they just got the ball in space. And Mac, what I, they were just absorbing our slow chipping play, and doing exactly the same, you know, as, as Geelong the previous week, just way, just forcing turnovers at half forward because we were our forward entries were starting from far too, far too deep. Far too deep on the wing. We again we fall into that trap of one too few possessions in the chain to get the ball in deep into our forward fifty, and it just bounces back out, and and our midfield get turned around on on the rebound, and they're nowhere to be seen, and we just get cut up with handballs, and that's exactly what Frio did. Yeah, I I, I just can't believe uh, how many. Uh unchallenged un, uh, marks they took in, in defence. Uh, Ryan and Pierce, they just had a, a field day back there. Yeah. Well, and you asked about possession. I don't have actual numbers, but I do have time in possession. So for the game, Mac, uh, it was uh, Frio um, 44 and uh, us 41. In the last quarter, it was Frio 52% to us 38. But in the last 10 minutes... When the game was there to be won, Frio 43, us 18%. We only actually had the ball in our possession 
for 1.8 minutes in the last 10 minutes of the game. Well, that's that, what really struck me that it was our fade in the last part of the last quarter. It just looked yep. like we gave up. It looked completely we like we, instead of being desperate, we just gave up. Uh, look, I actually, it looked to me, and there's a couple of times that I recall one, one game against Richmond years ago with Wallace coaching and, and a couple of other games where the boys simply ran out of ideas. They'd been yep. they'd been trying desperately to get inside fifties and and get score on the board, and they just simply did not have any ideas left in in the brain bank, and that's because we're playing this stupid, chipping around, kick it down the line, kick it on people's heads, no overlap run whatsoever, like it, it's horrific, and uh, that's it. It didn't look like they gave up to me. It just looked like they had. They didn't know what else to do. They had no, no ideas left. Yeah. I'm not saying not give up, but it just didn't say, didn't have that same desperate. didn't have desperation. That's the word I'm looking for. They, they, I mean, when you, if you're a fair to play, you keep thinking you can win, even if you're five goals down with five minutes to play. And even though logic is you probably won't. But you, when you're out there, you believe that. And... Um, but it didn't look like that. It looked like our players thought, well, we can't win this game. Yeah, I'll make an effort, but I'm not going to bust me guts. Well, yeah, I don't think it was an effort thing, Mac. I, I just, I don't know. We, we probably saw different things. I mean, again, in the Gold Coast game, you know, we were playing right till the final siren and we almost, almost, um, you know, stole it. Um, we certainly played that game out and I thought we would do the same with the Frio game, but... Like, just, and we didn't. Just We didn't. Just kept, we just kept doing the same thing we'd been doing all game, and like four or five minutes to go, and we're we I don't know, can't remember. Like there was two kicks in it or something or other, and instead of trying to get the ball forward quickly, we were just kicking it around the the back line from side to side. It's like, what the hell are you doing? It made absolutely no sense whatsoever to me. Well, let me throw this at you, Boom. We've had these three games. Do you think that there will be much many changes in the side next week? And do you think we can turn this form around? Well, I think they'll replace injured players. So at the moment, obviously, there's Miller that needs to be replaced. Um, quite likely Lockie Murphy um, and possibly um, Keane, depending on how his jaw is. So there's three changes right there. I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect them to... I wouldn't, uh, you know, they may drop Peddler. Um, I, I wouldn't expect there to be more than four changes. So who do you think how that many might... are forced. So how many do you think might, well, we know there's a couple of injuries. Um, so... Well, they've got to bring in Nankervis for Miller. I think that's, I mean, that's a given, although knowing the club, they'll probably bring in Paddy Parnell. It but... should be a given that for Nankervis, but yeah. Yeah, could bring in Paddy Parnell, you never know. Um, and if they're going to drop Luke Peddler, then Will Dowling's the obvious choice to come in mm -hmm. uh, to replace him. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, you know, I think the, the unforced change might be Dowling for Peddler. The rest mm -hmm. of them will be forced changes. Nankervis, hopefully Nankervis for Miller. Um, I don't know who they bring in for Keane. Uh, if he's if he's no good, they'll probably just play Curtin, one short. Curtin took ten marks in defence. Do we uh, do we do what other clubs do? And you have a good youngster, and you bring him in and just uh, play him and bear with whatever you get from him. If if, he, if his knee is okay, then absolutely. I mean, I would, um, but do you, I'm not so sure the club will. Oh well, I mean, who knows what the club will do? You're asking me what I'd do. I'd if his if his yeah. knee is okay, then then I'd bring him in. Well, you know, he, I mean, he didn't have a, a huge amount of that, but he took ten marks alone. He had ten marks, and he had a few other kicks as well. So yeah, Vardy saying that they good. were like cheap kicks in I'd, defense. Oh, okay. So you, well, you're just looking, you're just looking at stats, mate. Did you actually watch the game? 
No, I about to, I was about to say I didn't actually see the game, but I, <laughs> but I did see a write up that said he was, that said he was quite impressive with taking ten marks. Yeah, I'm still. I don't know. I, his fitness worries me. I don't know whether he's quite up, quite up to AFL fitness yet. Um, and there's that niggling knee issue that he's got. So I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Look, if he if he's right to go, then I would just bring him in. Okay. <laughs> Um, but certainly uh, Dowling and Nankervis made big uh, claims to, for inclusion. So I think that uh, d- if if Peddler comes out as an unforced, then Dowling comes in for that. And hopefully they play, if they do drop Peddler, they don't stick him on the emergency bench. They actually play him with Sam in the twos, mm. like you said, and, and let them, you know, let them show you that they're our next midfield combination yeah uh, look i'd love to see that work uh, i mean it really do would because um i i don't get any joy out of watching what we're doing at the moment it it's uh so depressing because so would you bring in uh, like so that that's what i think the club will do i i would also um if tex isn't right i'd be giving him a rest and if Tex is right, I'd be giving Fogarty a rest and I'd be bringing Lockie, Ch- uh, Lockie Gallant in. I wouldn't be opposed to that either because, um, they, you know, they, there's not much happening. When Burgess is your best forward, you know, you, you've got to do things. You know, um, Lockie Murphy hasn't done anything all season. So I don't know what we're going to do about that. Uh, but just somebody said in the chat that Ped will probably be our sub. That would be the worst thing that you could do. The, the oh, well, that's what they did worst. to Sam Berry last week. I know, which was absolutely madness. It's madness. Yeah. When you know, If you think a guy's not form isn't quite up to scratch, you don't put him in as a sub. You do actually put, give him a game in the two so you can actually get his form up and show you that he is back in form. Welcome to an hour and a half ago. That's what I said at the beginning of the bloody show, Macca. Yeah, well, I agree with you then. You just you've just got an anti berry bias. Um, um, Lucky Shoal, I don't think has earned his spot really. Chase Jones is 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 needs to provide more run off half back. Um, you know, Murphy should just shouldn't be in the squad. Um, but it's starting to run a little bit dry at this point with with the injuries that we've got. So, I mean, I'd love to see Zach Taylor get a run, but he's obviously not right yet. Um, oh, coming back that? from concussion. Zach Taylor will be coming back from concussion next week, hopefully. Yeah. Um, you know, Ned probably did enough to stay in the team. I thought he was busy. Kicked a nice goal. Um, so, yeah, I mean, can we beat Melbourne? Not a freaking chance, Macca. Not a chance. Yeah. Uh, I reckon that uh, you've got more chance of kicking a goal from 60 metres out than we have of winning. Yeah, well, given that I'm still unable to do the bloody goal-kicking challenge because I'm just not quite right yet, that's, what, two weeks? Two weeks. <laughs> are, you, are you still suffering, are you, mate? A little bit. Just, I'm not, I was going to go out for a kick today and I thought, oh, I'm just not quite confident enough. I don't want to knock myself out for another two weeks. So I'm just going to give it another week. Just give it another week, and then we'll uh, we'll be doing three on the trot over gather round. Uh, well, that'll be good to see. Um, just coming back to Melbourne, um, having taken care of Port Adelaide, uh, they're staying here for the week, so they're not travelling. So they're going to be here for gather round, and they'll be uh, acclimatised to the local situation. And they don't, you know, to keep, you know, when they played Port, they had to travel to get here. Now that they're here, they don't have to travel to play us. And if they can do that to Port, they'll carve us. If we only give her the same effort uh, as we have been doing, somebody said in the chat, 10 goals, look, that's not unrealistic if we play like we did, in particularly in the last quarter of this week. That was just very poor stuff. Not we, a, only not kick, we only kick one more goal than West Coast this weekend. Um yep against comparable opposition. And look, my impression was, Macca, that Fremantle didn't play outstandingly well. They played in bursts. They got us a couple of times, but they never put us away until the last few minutes. 
you know, you get us in front of a team like Melbourne who are obviously starting to hit some decent form, I think we're going to get crushed. I think it's going to be absolutely embarrassing. Well, I think that, you know, with the national spotlight on, on Adelaide, um, I think we will try. But if you match up our cattle against Melbourne's cattle, it just doesn't measure up. Um, because I don't think we're as good as Port Adelaide either. So, and we and, and we've got so too many players uh, out of form as well, um, and not not contributing very much. It could easily be a ten goal defeat. So, and the, and the 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 problem is that you know we get torched by Melbourne this week. Say that's three, uh, four losses. Um, you know, uh, and quite likely a heavy loss to Melbourne. But there's absolutely no pressure on the coach. And that's what you do, Mac. See, this is this is the paradox, right? Because that's what you do. you you give a coach breathing space when you want to give him time to develop players. But what we've done is give Matthew Nix breathing space when he's playing all the seniors. It's completely ass about face. That is one hundred percent correct. What you just said, absolutely one hundred percent correct. You don't give the breathing. Yeah, when the guy's not playing the juniors, when he actually thinks he, when he thinks in his mind he's got a team that's good enough to play in the eight, and he's made that statement, yeah, um, then well, the breath, well, any breathing space is gone, so he has to yeah. perform because he's made the statement, and that's that's right. But any any person that's worth their salt, anybody who's got any idea how to manage a club and manage anything would have made him wait 10 games to see what see whether he has got the cattle. But see that if he has got the ability to get the best out of these uh, these players. And um, they've given him this uh, two-year contract. Really, that means he's, we've got him for the next three years, doesn't it? Out this year well, plus another two. What it, what it means is that there's absolutely no pressure on Nixie to, um, to do anything. Exactly. So, so, like, he, we could get thumped by a hundred points for the next three rounds, and what's going to happen? Are the club big enough to admit that they got it wrong, and and sack him? Well, they should, you know, it's not a case of uh, they. You could argue that everybody, every side has slumps and all that sort of stuff, but I don't like the way we've lost. And as I said, I can only repeat what I've said all along. Any any club that's worth its salt would have actually made him wait till about round ten. The the proof in the pudding, not just gamble on it. So I mean, we gambled again with Miller with a five year extension. Yeah, the guy yeah. that gets injuries all the time. It's yeah, I know, but extension. I want to I want to look for yeah, but I want to look forward, Macca. Right, I don't want to look backwards. We've already, we've done that all to death. You know, we all know that Nick shouldn't have been re-signed. I'm saying, what's the club going to do in three weeks' time when we still haven't won a game? And we've got thumped a couple of times. We'll stand by our coach. That's what we'll get. Well, I don't think I don't think that supporters will put up with that. To be honest, no, we supporters won't, and we'll moan and we'll grow, and but it will just continue the same as it is. I don't think the media will let them off scot free on that one. No, I'm sure they won't. I'm sure they won't, and neither they should. Um, and you know, if we if we get thumped a couple of times, like gather round. Um, in the showdown, all the rest of it, they are going to start feeling it financially because people are going to stop turning up. I, I would suggest, true. I would suggest that if we don't start winning games, the effect on the club, the impact on the club, might be worse than when we would, than when we were bottoming out, because I think the expectation back then was that we weren't like we weren't expected to win games so we were happy just to watch the kids come in and develop and all the rest of it but there's massive expectation this year massive expectation so i certainly um, i certainly did I, and you certainly did but we, we thought oh, that you know well i did say to you macca that i thought that it, it would be a test i i wasn't i wasn't as bullish i was actually more bullish last year than i than i was at the beginning of this year but I thought with with decent improvement and a decent game plan that we'd be around the mark. We're nowhere mm. near it, obviously. So I I'm very interested to see what the club's going to do because I can't see us winning a game in the next four weeks. 
Well, that's a very optimistic <laughs> future to look forward to, me. Well, I mean, can you? Well, it is a fun, football's a funny thing. You can sometimes you just get a day where they are all switched on and they do play, and that, but that's what we can hope for because if you're going on form, you're right. Well, I, I just can't see it, Mac. I, 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 I just fail to see. Like, if we look at the ladder, who we got up next? We got Melbourne next. Who've we got after that? We've got. Um, that's the showdown. Uh, must be I, I, the showdowns on May the. Th- uh, yeah, Carlton over there. Oh God. Yeah, exactly. We got North in Tassie. We got Port in the showdown. Like I said, we could be six and zero, and I wouldn't doubt that we're six and zero. We got Essendon. Hmm. It's not looking good. Well, and I guess good. that's my, that's that's where I'm curious to see what the club's going to do in three or four weeks' time um, when we're still winless and we've copped a couple of thumpings? Well, really, I mean, we are in a situation that if we do perform very poorly and we are are Norton 6 and uh, struggling to win a game, we've really wasted a rebuild and got to start all over again. Well, and that takes me back to the beginning, Mac. I think we, uh, you know, that's where we, that's where we are. I, I know you're in denial about it, but that's that's where we are. I think we're going to have to turn over the list again. Oh, you're probably right. I just want to be in denial because I don't, I don't like, <laughs> I don't like the sound oh, of it. Oh, look, thing. I do too. And look, if they change their selection strategies and if they actually start entrusting the kids with some stuff, maybe it won't be so painful. Maybe it's just another draft or two. You know, just to just to get in a little bit more talent. We've got you know Tyler Welsh coming in next year. We the, the way we're going, we're probably going to be, have access to young Sid Draper, who looks like he's going to be a bit of a champ. Um, you know, there, there's upside, but it really depends on what the coaching staff and the club decide to do. If they continue down this road, belligerently and stubbornly just going down this road, then I don't I don't see an outcome. And I, I see players leaving as a consequence through lack of opportunity. Well, Rabbit's a real optimist. He's saying we, we could be naught, naught and ten going into the Eagles game. Well, we <laughs> oh, actually my. could. We actually could be Macker if you if you're being realistic about it. Given our given our current form, um, I don't see us. I don't see us winning any game apart from West Coast. Maybe Hawthorne, because Hawthorne don't look great either. I don't see us beating North and Tassie. Well, we could. If we played well, we could. But they do have to... When was the, la- when was the last they time they we beat they have- North and Tassie? I oh, know, we haven't got a great record against them. No. And, and, and I will say this, they do have some outstanding young players. They, they really have got a good future. But I mean, then again, they've had about probably about seven... Picks at the draft right at the, the pointy end in a row. Yeah, so. well, that that is what it is. I mean, we're just talking about the here and now. Anyway, Mac, um, there's no one else. I don't think putting their hand up in the chat. You've got a couple of minutes left in the in uh, on uh, Discord in the audience there. If you want to have a quick say, um, mate, we have uh, had a bumper live audience tonight. I've been watching the numbers. We've had. Been tracking it around between eighty and ninety on YouTube, about a hundred and eighty on on Twitter. Um, you know, plus uh, plus our cast of thousands here on Discord, so another two hundred and fifty odd um, live listeners. So we appreciate everyone who tunes in on a Sunday night, particularly on an Easter weekend when everyone's supposed to be away fishing. Well, you know, I, I'd love to be telling them. Uh, and I'm sorry, fellas, it's all been doom and gloom, but we could lie and say everything was good. <laughs> well, people have got eyes, mate. We want to have some credibility. We're not, the bloody, cro- we're not the bloody Crojek. We. <laughs> well, uh, unfortunately, they've all got eyes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean that. That was a cheap shot. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I know, I know but... I always feel a bit lousy when we end the show when all we've done is moan and groan, but 
I, you know, I, I just I, I just can't think of any up, being uplifting at the moment. No, I, well, look, I, I mean, sorry, go on, mate. I was just going to say, I just hope that they do give some of these young blokes a go and that uh, they click and that we can actually... Uh, somebody's being really nasty calling the show two grumpy old men. Um, yeah. No, but it'd be nice just to see some of the young lads give them a go and uh, uh, and that we... It was roast chicken I have for tea tonight, mate, if you're interested. Somebody <laughs> Come else. on, mate, um, straighten up. <laughs> yeah, it would just be nice if some of those young players came in and they actually were given a chance and in their in their correct spot and then they played well. Yeah, very true, very true. Well, look, I, I think we've uh, I think we've done it. We're not going to do quite the epic podcast that we did last week, which went until bloody Tuesday. Um, I've got well, I've got one last question to ask you, Pete. Oh, all right. Do you, do you think that if we lose badly to Melbourne? Do you think there is any chance, any chance, that the hierarchy of the club might review the situation and see that we're fat, uh, very badly staffed and, and actually understaffed in the coaching department and do something about it? No. Well, that's pretty blunt. <laughs> no, no chance whatsoever. Well, we don't have we don't have adequate staff. I mean, we we don't have adequate staff. So, see, Mackie, you've got to you've got to remember that it took a massive public groundswell and and a relentless media to get the club kicking and screaming to a to a review in mm. twenty twenty. Mm-hmm. Right? It, it was it it was like they resisted it till the bitter end. You know, Rashido saying we should go back for someone else and all the rest of it. To the bitter end, they resisted it. And even at the bitter end, they refused to have a whole of club review. They ended up just reviewing the football department. Now, if you have a look at some of the... Um, oh, Bayside is here. I'll bring you on in a sec, Bayside. If you have a look at some of the other clubs that have had big reviews and gone on to be successful, Geelong's was a whole of club review. Richmond's yep. was a whole of club review. And the one thing about those two clubs, Macca, because don't forget, Mark Thompson had been there for five years when they did that review at Geelong, and Hardwick had been at Richmond for a couple of years at that stage. They both had very strong leaders. Both had very strong CEOs. They had Brian Cook at, at Geelong, and they had Brennan Gale at Richmond. Very strong individuals. Outstanding now, who, do we, who do we have in our club that is comparable to those people. We don't have anyone. We don't have anyone in, in our club. Well, I will say this, though, surely, uh, because they they want to they will want to protect Nix's ass because they've appointed him and to actually do say uh, for him to uh, perform poorly is uh, clearly points to them being wrong. But they just might... Uh, put some support around Nix because of the fact that, and I'll say that the unfortunately Nix has hadn't had a, their appropriate support and therefore we put some uh, more support around him. I'm hoping that's what happens anyhow, and, and sensibly that's what should happen. Yeah. Um, Base, I can come in uh, and have your say, mate. We've got a couple of minutes left. How are you going? Yeah, really well, really well. Um Frustrated good to have you on, mate. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, good. Long, long time viewer, first time caller. Um, oh, you just exactly said what I was um, struggling with, which is just that they always back in their decisions. They make a decision, and then you know, mm. it could all go to shit. But they're never, never backing away from that. And um, it just seems, yeah, incredibly frustrating because you know there was no need to sign Nick's so early, and. Um, yeah, we could have left it till late in the year. Um, I, I'm fighting a. Uh, sometimes it feels like a losing battle to to keep my uh, my seven year old <laughs> a crow supporter over, living over in Victoria. And um, this year, I was quite excited. A couple of games at the G in the afternoon, be able to go there. Yeah, excited about us potentially, you know, being competitive. And uh, and yeah, now staring down the <laughs> down the barrel of I. I Really can't see us winning anything in the first eight games at the moment. Um, taking my boy down to uh, to Hobart to to watch North, I thought, oh, we might be in for the chance now. Yeah. And uh, now 
yeah, worried we're going to be down there and uh, blowing a gale and uh, and get done again. So the only hope that I can you know hold on to is that we actually start playing the kids because that that's exciting for me seeing right. them and yeah. Bayside, you're a bloody sadist. You're actually going down to Tasmania. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I am. I uh, yeah. I, I, he's excited about the boat trip, and uh, and I'll visit some friends. So there's, there'll be a couple of positives, but um, yeah. But it won't so be Bayside, the Bayside, Bayside <laughs> no, at the beginning I'm, of the season. I'm worried. Bayside at the beginning of the season has looked at the looked at the fixture and gone. Now, which one can I take him to? That's going to be a guaranteed win. I know North down at Tassie. That'll be a guaranteed win, and that's not played out quite the way you would have hoped. <laughs> no, no. I thought we'd have at least a couple more wins on the board, and uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah. Uh, so on, you are a courageous man. <laughs> thank you. But, so yeah, how do we turn like, it around, you know, mate? How, do, is it just playing the kids? Is that it? Do we need to uh, have a look a bit deeper again? It's it's playing the kids in the positions that they're drafted for. Like it's it's. I feel like everyone who calls in, everyone who commenting, is like just redoing the same thing. It's rehashing. It's it's like yeah. It's the the Saligo, the fact that he was a sub, you know, the fact that you, you just see he's a player. And mm, he yeah. goes in the middle and stuff happens. And even though, uh, Mac, I get your point that Peddlers hasn't performed well the last couple of weeks, but stuff happens when he's in the middle, when he's around the ball. True. Like, he's 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 got the burst. He's, he's got the grunt. Um, and I agree with you, Macca, about Barry. He, he's got the ability to stand up and, and push through. And, yeah, like, get those guys in. Um, the thing that I hate most is just – seeing these blind dump kicks into the forward line, which play mm. into the, you know, we, we don't have tall marking or, or high jumping forwards. We've got leading forwards. You need to lower the eyes and hit up our guys. So unless they're yeah. going to bring Gollan in, um, we need players who don't dump kick in the forward line. So that's your yeah. Brody Smiths out. That's your Rory Laird out. And it's like, yeah, it's, um, yeah, I think it's, we just need to start to, to cycle past those guys and, um, and bring in some young ones, but you know, it's some really good stuff there, both right? That's good stuff. Oh, it's just reiterating what all everyone of, else all, said, you know, all of it, <laughs> all of it refuting what you said, um, Macca, but that's okay, not everything, mate. <laughs> pretty <Yeah>. much. <laughs> God, I anybody that you're offside has really got problems, mate. <laughs> Oh, mate, you're thick skin, mate. You can do, mate. It's good to have you on both sides. Hopefully, uh, it won't be your last time. No, you're yes. welcome anytime, mate. You make make good sense. Beautiful, All thanks, right. guys. Very good. And uh, Mac, I reckon we might uh, we might leave it at that. Uh, we've got uh, a big game coming up Thursday night. It's uh, as we're all we're all, I think we're all just kind of. Waiting with bated breath to see what the club's going to do during the week. Are they going to cut and, and slash and burn and and change their ways and admit their faults and come out with a new strategy and a new lineup and kick some ass, or are we just going to chip it around in defence and, and run out the clock? <laughs> um, well, I think we just wander out from the field and get our asses kicked, don't you think? <laughs> yeah. Quite possibly. Uh, Tommy in the chat with the cast be on Spreaker tonight probably won't uh, propagate until uh, later, um, but uh, it will be on at some stage tonight. And all, on obviously, Macca, on all the podcasting plat- platforms, iTunes and all the rest of it, um, tomorrow for those that want to listen in. Um, look, mate, oh, I think we're going to get pumped uh, and uh, I'm not looking forward to watching it but we're dyed in the wool crows fans and even though you know we we have our have bits to say and all the rest of it at the end of the day and i think it's the same for everyone that listens to this podcast we just want the the, the lads to win we just want some success for the club we want the club to be successful so if we weren't passionate mate we wouldn't be sitting here on a sunday night would we well uh, being uh, partly insane helps as well but um, <laughs> no, but in, in all seriousness, uh, we do love the club and we do want it to go well. But that doesn't mean to say that we have to suck up and say that the club's doing the right thing. No, and that's I, right. And I, and I think it's our job 
if we're going to be honest with ourselves and we're going to be honest with the people that listen to us, is to tell the truth as we see it. Now, we might be right and we might be wrong, but at least we are saying how, what we really think about it. Very true. And, uh, mate, on that note, I think we will call it a night. Thanks to the 300-plus live viewers that we've had tonight, Macca, on all the various platforms and in Discord. It's amazing. Uh, don't forget, if you're watching us on, on YouTube, give us a subscribe and a like. It really does help us along. Um, the support there has been really good. Uh, get into our Discord chat. Uh, what are we up to? We're up to over 365 members now in Discord, so that community is really growing as well. And as you'd imagine, Macca, and you're not on there much during the week. You've got to go down there a little bit more, Mac. But as you'd oh. imagine, the conversation well, has been fairly strong uh, during the yeah. week. Yeah, well, the thing is that... Um I've got a situation we had a, fa a death in the family, and uh, I've oh, got. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, well, I didn't like him anyway, so it doesn't matter. Um, oh, come but, on, mate. We don't need no, to have this on the podcast. I'm wrapping up, for God's sake. No, no, but what I'm saying is I don't have much time because I've got to work on the bloody estate. Yeah, that's great. And uh, thanks for your good feel for the show when I'm trying to wrap up the show and all that. That's really great. Uh, working like silk, you are, Macca. You're a pleasure to have on sometimes. <laughs> Far out. All right. As for the rest of it, all right. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks, everyone. Uh, enjoy your Easter Monday. Who have we got on Monday? It's a pretty crap game, isn't it? Hawthorne and someone? Geelong. Hawthorne and Geelong. So we won't be watching the footy. So enjoy your Monday off everyone be safe uh if you're away and you're driving back be drive safely and all that sort of crap and we will see you next sunday when uh everything's changed the crows have caused a massive upset and we're all happy again look i'd love that to be the truth i don't think it'll <laughs> happen but I, I would love it to be the truth because we do love the club <laughs> and we'll have three three rounds of kick challenge as well so until then everyone stay safe be good and uh, we'll see you next week not all. Yep. Good night all.